Committee meeting of 2013. And members of the public are advised that our meetings are webcast by the City of Hamilton and temporarily archived on the City's website. Other individuals in the meeting may also be audibly or visibly recording this meeting. Also, your telephones, blackberries, and pagers are to be switched to a non-audible function during the Council and Committee meetings. Mr. Clerk, are there any changes to the agenda? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, we have uh, two delegation requests to speak today to uh, item 8.1 on the, the agenda, and we also have a, a request uh, that item 8.1 on the agenda be moved to after the consent items uh, at a consideration for those in attendance. Certainly. I have a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Moved by Runa, second by Powers. All in favor? Carried. Carried. Any declarations of interest? Seeing none, may I please have a motion on the minutes of April the 8th. Moved by Collins, seconded by Powers. All in favor? Carried. And we have two delegation requests to speak today. Uh, item eight point, uh, regarding item 8.1, what is the desire of the committee? Moved by Jackson to be approved, seconded by DeVal. All in favor? Carried. Carried. Consent items. We have five consent items before us. Is there any questions respecting them? Seeing none, can I have a motion to approve items 5, 1 through 5, 6. Moved by Collins, second by Whitehead. Discussion, all in favor? Carried. <coughs> um, we have two delegation requests, and before we begin, I remind you to try to remain within the five-minute timeline. So the delegation uh, request from Tura Carissel, uh, respecting agenda item 8.1, is uh, Tura here? Come on down to the podium then, please. I assume I mispronounced your last name, so. <laughs> I should have rehearsed it ahead of time. <laughs> so so it's, maybe you can introduce yourself sure. and you have five minutes for your presentation. Thank you. I'm just, uh, I think you have a copy of the letter that I provided. My name is Tara Karosho. And Put the microphone down. Sure. Here. Thank you. Is that okay? Yep. Okay, great. And I'm just going to read you the letter and I uh, thank you for your time today. So uh, to the committee, I've written numerous letters and emails, attended meetings and interviewed with local papers, and still feel that the city has not fully recognized the full extent of the issues on Highland Road. I understand that Hamilton is a very large city with many ongoing issues for the city to deal with. However, the issues on Highland Road are real and they are not perceived. I also recognize that there's a large investment of monies going into Highland Road, and both as a resident of Highland Road and a taxpayer, these monies need to be spent to address the issues on Highland and make the area safer for residents and the children. When speaking with local police that monitor the area, I was surprised to learn that they were unaware of the changes to the area, specifically the Mount Albion closure and the flow of traffic to Highland Road and Pritchard. I would think that this group of individuals would have great information to share as they are in our area every day. I've had previous communications with Mullen Phillip and appreciate his timely response. However, I still have some unanswered questions and feel that they could, more can be done to address the issues. Number one, the corner of Winterberry and Highland Road. More cars are going to be using this intersection with the Mount Albion closure. There are major issues here with rolling stops, which have been confirmed by the police, that monitor this area frequently and are constantly pulling people over. I've requested that we install larger stop signs or a red flashing light at this intersection. This is also a crossing for children to get to the school in the park and hopefully with some extra planning down to the conservation area. Number two, signs to be posted on the south side of Highland Road right after the intersection of Winterberry and Highland. Examples would be 50 kilometers, kids at play, watch your speed, etc. There are three poles here to post signs, and this would also help drivers transition from the rural area of Highland Road into the urban area of Highland Road, and that's where we see the speeds coming across. Parking to be removed on the south side of Highland, I know this is uh, um, on the plan. I want to ensure that there's uh, parking currently right in front of the nursing home. There are four spots there currently, um, and those that definitely need to be removed. Um, it is a complete blockage for the houses at the top of the hill of Highland Road to be able to see, um, to get out of their driveways or even to cross the road. Uh, number five, uh, sorry, number four. The, there's a path area on Highland Road Okay, that does not match up with the path on the other side of the road. So kids have to walk along the street to get from one side of the path to the other. The first path comes out on the north side of City View and the other path continues on the south side past City View. 
Okay. Um, and there's only, with the sidewalks being only on one side, they can't even get to the intersection to cross safely. I would uh, recommend that there would be, this area could be considered for a crosswalk. Or that the path on the south side be continued to match up with the path on the north side. Number five, we did get a speed radar trailer. Um, it was put there about two weeks ago for one week. But however, it was put there on one side of the road. It didn't address the traffic on the other side of the road. And uh, you know, I, d I don't really feel that putting a uh, speed radar for one week is going to stop a behavior that's been there for several, several years. The other and final issue is the sidewalks. Um, in an email that I received from Owen Phillips, sidewalks on the south side was mentioned. This has never been dis discussed before with any of the residents or brought up at any of our area meetings. The issue here from residents are that if this is being considered that no boulevard be put in the, and the sidewalk be right at the curb, um, similar to the sidewalks on the south side, um, further down closer to Centennial Parkway. The house values on Highland Road are already dropping due to the volume of traffic. We would like to see minimal changes to our front yards and driveways as parking now being moved just to the, south, um, to the north side will also be at a premium for the area. And I thank you for your time and consideration into these issues and um, it's a pleasure meeting you. Thanks, Charles. Any questions for Stuart? Okay, we can come to that later. Uh, Councillor Whitehead. Just one question. Uh when we put sidewalks in now, the new standards to put boulevards, the reason for it is uh, for snow plowing and storage of snow. Otherwise, you're narrowing the street and creates other safety issues. So I'm trying to understand um, the concern about not having boulevards when I guess that is the new standard to ensure that we don't have uh, people selling the sidewalks and snow covered and then get snow plowed and of course you get all the snow uh, on the and I, we recognize that piece and, you know, I, I haven't really, um, we've brought it up slightly with the neighbors, we, it's going to be a big issue. The, the other issue there is that we have, you know, driveways that carry two or three cars and uh, when you put a boulevard in, we're losing that much more of our driveways and now that we're removing the parking from the south side and only putting it on the north side and the houses closer down to Winterberry are adjacent to a mountain of townhomes that already occupy all those those spots on the street, it's going to be a nightmare. So I, we do recognize that piece, but we, you know, if we keep some of our front lawns, it can go up there and we'll just work a little harder to remove it. Um, it's also further up, closer to Centennial Parkway, you'll find that there are certain areas where the boulevard has gone, where there hasn't been any homes yet. They've gone and put a boulevard in and then back in front of the homes, they've gone right back out to the curb lane. Um, and I think down by, um, I live closer to the nursing home area and there's a great big huge hill there. So I'm thinking you're going to have to go to the curb anyways. Um, and then, you know, there's some areas there where um, the plow, plow can go. Thank you. Councillor Kirk. Just on that issue, I, I had spoken to a number of the residents and one of the, the concerns that popped up is that there's the loss of parking on the street. But if the boulevard is utilized, a lot of the homes along there where they can get three or four smaller cars in the driveway because of the length of the driveway, they would lose that if a boulevard comes in in light of the fact that the city's talking about um, um, prohibiting any parking on the boulevards. If you recall a couple of meetings back that came up and so that would really start to inhibit the amount of parking that's available and the majority of those homes all have extended families living there. They're not just nuclear families, so it would become a problem. Yeah, Councilor Clark, I assume you'll address her uh, Tara's questions to staff after we're done. So Tara, thank you for coming out. I understand you got a small baby at home, so thanks for taking the time to <laughs> find him out here. Motion received. Whitehead thank seconded by Powers. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. The next request is from Margaret Reed, respecting uh, the same item, 8.1. So Mrs. Reed, are you here? Come on down to the podium. So Margaret, you just give your name and address and sure. get right up against the microphone so okay. we can hear you. Thank you. Great. The floor is yours. 
Thank you. Uh, my name is Margaret Reed. I've been a resident of Upper Mount Albion for over 20 years. Um, we understand that de development's expected in the neighbourhood. Um, I'm here to speak on both my own behalf and the residents of our road, and thank you to those that are able to come out today. I also want to thank the Public Works Department and Mohan Phillips and his team for deciding on reviewing and coming up with recommendations um, and solutions for closing Upper Mount Albion and to thank the City Councillors and staff for um, being aware and conscious of the situation of residents as well. And special thanks to Councillor Clark for listening and helping to mitigate the problems with speeding and uh, increasing our uh, police presence in the neighbourhood and limiting truck usage. So why is it a good decision to close Upper Mount Albion Road? Upper Mount Albion is a rural road with ditches and very uh, narrow or almost non-existent shoulders in most places. Um, we're in the middle of a rapidly expanding urban area uh, surrounded by Summit Park and the Bimbrook traffic and the Supercenter and Home Depot on the other end, as well as highway access. Upper Mount Albion is not paved to standards uh, that are necessary for the 10,000 plus cars a day that we're getting. Um, we are, uh, this is evident by the potholes that are being filled on a weekly basis throughout the winter and the spring season. We have eroding shoulders and we have um, asphalt edges that are crumbling and falling apart, making it difficult for kids to ride bikes and do any of that. Uh, the road is narrow and it encourages much speeding. Okay? Upper Mount Albion is always busy and most travel above the posted 50 kilometer um, an hour limit. Accessing our driveways is dangerous, and in fact, one of our neighbors was seriously injured by an impatient driver while trying to turn into his own driveway. He was hospitalized for several days. Uh, during rush hour, traffic is at a standstill, often blocked from Rymel to almost the conservation land parking uh, that's there. On weekends, the traffic's continuous. Getting out of our driveway, it isn't unusual to take five to ten minutes um, for us to get out of our driveways. Taking my kids to school, which is a 10 minute walk, which we can't do for safety reasons, is a 10 minute drive because I have to get out of the same driveway. School buses will not drop off our children, except if they're on the right side of the road because they can't trust that cars will stop when the school bus signs are out. Uh, the post office has deemed the road unsafe and now our rural mail delivery is now in a community mailbox. Our biggest concern is safety of, a, of the pedestrians. So with increased walking traffic from Summit Park and the opening and charging for the airmost cars parking, more people are being encouraged to walk. It's not uncommon to see people dodging off and on what little shoulder we have, joggers tripping into the ditches and into potholes, cars honking and swerving to miss the cyclists. I will not allow my children to walk to school, the movies or to work for safety reasons. Summit Park residents, often unbeknownst to them, they don't really realize how busy and treacherous the street are, and they're walking their strollers down the street. I can't imagine what was going to happen when the new BR High School opens, and we have, uh, which is now already over capacity, um, and we're going to have upwards of 1,000 kids at lunchtime walking down the road trying to get to the uh, fast food restaurants down in the Supercenter. There's already been a young man hit while walking along the road. So the closure is the right decision. Economically, the closer is the right move too. Our housing values have decreased with the increasing traffic. Uh, it just takes a buyer trying to reverse out of, the par of our parking spots uh, to realize their buying decision wouldn't be here. Um, also, my concern is the potential for litigation towards the city because this road is unsafe. So if there's accidents occurring, you know, I'm worried that that's going to affect our tax rates. So closure is the right decision. So I want to thank you for your time, and I want you to thank you for considering our safety and, I, and for making the right decision. I do have a letter I'd like to read from one of our residents, if that's okay. She wasn't able to come today. So it says, please accept this letter to be read by my fellow neighbours in regards to the long overdue, much needed road closure of Upper Mount Albion Road in Stony Creek. We purchased our home in 1991 and were told at that time the road would be closed. As the development invaded us, we cannot even enjoy our front yards or driveways. The almost 10,000 cars per day on this little rural road is a death trap waiting to happen. The noise from vehicles is an issue. There is always significant garbage everywhere. The postal service and the school board has deemed the road a hazard. Our children would have lost the opportunity to be able to walk to a neighbor's or ride their bikes to the local park. I do hope the city follows through with the recommended road closures, and the sooner the better for the safety of all our citizens. And that's from the Duncan family right down at the end. Okay, okay thanks, Margaret. Any questions for Margaret? 
Seeing none, can I motion to receive the presentation? Moved by Jackson, seconded by Dahl. All in favor carried. Thank you very much. Um, okay, members of the committee, we, uh, you now have the report before us and, and Councillor Clark's in attendance and asked to speak on this issue. I think you requested to ask to ask some questions too. So Councillor Clark, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, just to put all of this into a little bit of perspective, this process actually started about six years ago. Six years ago, we started reviewing the secondary plan for um, the Trinity neighborhood property, which is east of Upper Mount Albion, which was the, the Karst property, and, and you're all well aware of what transpired after that review was completed by the city. We preserved the Karst land property. The, we also started the West Trinity Review Secondary Plan, which is the Upper Mount Albion, which actually deals with um, the closure of the road itself, and went through that process, which took about two and a half years. When we completed that process, the next thing that we had to do was actually update the environmental assessment, which is really what's before you now. Um, for all intents and purposes, this is the ROPA 9 review, which now looks at all of the transportation in the area, Highland, Pritchard, um, Rymel, everything and how it connects together. And there are all subtle changes, um, or some changes, I shouldn't say subtle, some changes to almost all of the roads in the area. So this has been a long process coming. I can tell you that there, it is not one that um, is with unanimity of opinion. There are residents on Second Road who um, are um, stolid in their beliefs that Second Road should also close. There are residents in, in different areas of the community that don't like something in this proposal. They don't like bicycle lanes, and, and so it's not something that everyone's going to wave the flag. At the end of the day, the vast majority of the changes will make the roads much safer in the area for the kids to, to traverse. Um, the high school is going to open next um, this September. Um, so you've got a situation where um, the high school at the top on Rymel Road um, is really just about a seven or eight minute walk for kids down to the fast food restaurants on a road that currently has anywhere from eight to 10,000 vehicles a day on it. So it is, it is treacherous from that side. So at the end of the day, traffic, after all the reviews with the, the staff, came up with the plan that you have on table one, page two of 10 of your report. Um, Upper Mount Albion would close, but it's, it's not just a, a straight closure. It's a cul-de-sac at Upper Mount Albion because there's an additional road that's being created to the west that goes into the new neighborhood that's being developed. So there's a secondary plan for that new neighborhood. Um, on Second Road, where there has been um, some significant cut through traffic. Uh, the proposal is to put in place uh, speed cushions on the intersection. So these are not speed bumps per se, but the entire intersection rises up, you come up and you slow down and you go over it. And we have used them in other areas of the city and they've been very effective. Uh, the sidewalk on Second Road West, that has been on the books for seven years now. So it will be completed, which will give the the, the families a place to walk without having to walk halfway up one side of Second Road, crossing the road and using the sidewalk on the other side to get the rest of the way. Um, the bike lanes, um, we've had a lot of discussion about the bike lanes. What has happened in Upper Stony Creek is there is, and Councillor Jackson can, can speak to this, there is an awful lot of interest uh, and a lot of bikes on the road. We didn't want to have bike lanes duplicated on every single cross-section road across the mountain because it becomes problematic. So we wanted to know and funnel them in a certain area. So Highland Road seemed the most probable in terms of doing that. And it also connects to all of the rail trails. So um, if you're traveling along the bike trail on, on um, Highland, you can connect to the rail trail that goes into um, uh, the Aramosa Karst, which is, is paved, and you can drive your bike all through there. You can also go in the other direction and, and head down towards the mountain and connect up with the other loop of, of the East Mountain Trail. Um, so there's great connectivity there. And finally, the sidewalks along Highland Road, um, 
and again, it's the, the residents' concern is that they don't want to lose uh, more of their parking that's allowed in their driveway currently. And I can understand the concern given that we are taking some parking off of the street in order to make the road safer. Um, so those are the recommendations that our staff came up with. I fully support them. We have had dozens of meetings um, on this with, with the public. This has not been something that has been done in the back room and the public has been, been fully involved throughout the entire process. Um, I would suggest with, re with respect to um, the letter from Tara that there are some minor things that could be done. Um, for example, on the stop signs, um, putting the tiger tails on the stop signs will draw more attention to the ones that where people are rolling through. And we did this on Second Road and it was quite effective. So putting a little larger uh, stop signs and, and tiger tails on it will, will help there. Um, larger signs with regards to the speed limit. We do have some issues in Upper Stony Creek where we've got roads up there. For example, Centennial Parkway, it's an 80 kilometer an hour road but you're pulling out from Highland, which is a 50 kilometer an hour road. So we're having those issues also that we're not resolving here, but we will be coming back with plans in terms of how we can fix those issues also. Um, the speed radar trailer, um, as you know, my counselors know, we, we can't get great access to that. It's when it's available, because there's lots of interest in having that, that trailer out there it did point to that there are people who are, are speeding along that road. Um, one of the things that the consultants pointed out is because of the width of the road, people think they can do it really quickly. If we um, put parking on and bicycle lanes in and, and demarcate the, the, the roadway all the way down, um, it's their expectations that the, the, the speeding will slow down dramatically. Um, and the last one is, is there's been uh, discussions about the uh, the Trinity Church extension and at that point I Mr. Chairman I would ask our staff um, we're getting different stories now um, as to when Trinity Church extension the construction will begin and will uh, be completed I know Councillor Jackson and I are eager to have it expedited as quickly as possible but if you could ask staff um, their best guess now in terms of when it would be open because that will also be alleviating a lot of the problems in Upper Stony Creek. Jerry, who should answer that question? Through you, Mr. Chair, I, it's right now, as the councilor noted, we're, we're still trying to determine that um, um, wildlife corridor. Uh, once that's resolved, and it depends on when that is, um, if it was very, very soon, there, there, we might be able to start something late this fall, but I would think that this year is probably a write-off to starting that, so we'd start in the spring. If that's the case, it could be open as early as next fall. Oh, um, Mr. Chairman, and, and I, this is, and, and I hate bringing these things to, to, to the committee, the, but we have been trying for a little over a year now, Councillor Jackson, Councillor Johnson and myself with Councillor McCaddy and the Conservation Authority to try and resolve a late request that came in from the Conservation Authority to put in an eco passage under Trinity Church Road extension. Um, we asked for a biological survey. Uh, we just found out a month ago that there are no deer in that area, so that's not an issue. Um, we thought we had an agreement, and staff, um, Mr. Moore can speak to this. We thought we had an agreement. We sat in the meeting, Council Jackson was there, and instead of a 75 um, um, meter buffer, it was going to be a 35 meter buffer, which we thought was a reasonable size, and we could get on with the building of the roadway. And everyone in the room was in agreement, including the Conservation Authority, and two weeks after that, maybe three weeks after that, we received a letter and the Conservation Authority was back to a request for 75 meters um, without any substantive proof that that is what is required. My concern, Mr. Chairman, is that this keeps spinning in circles and the road's not getting built. We've got three developers ready to go. They're wanting to start. They can't because the road's not being built. I've got residents who are eager to have this new roadway open. We have 
uh, businesses who are eager to set up shop in Upper Stony Creek in the Glanbrook area in the industrial park. They can't do it because the road won't be built yet. I'm at a loss in terms as, as my work as a councillor and Councillor Jackson, we've done everything we can to push this thing. We're now kind of caught and I don't want to be, um, I don't want to hold up the construction for an eco passage where we know there are no deer. Are no deer in the Aramosa Cars Conservation Authority, so there is no no migration of deer in that area, and I couldn't even speak to the cost of building that size eco passage, but I know it's significant. So um, I'll leave it to you and the committee to try and figure out if there's a way that we can resolve this to get this road built expeditiously. Thank Just you. A, a question, as chair, of Delta committee members, a number of you sit on the board of the Conservation Authority. Can you not get a resolution through your own board? Um, <laughs> We, we can try and do that, but at the present time, um, it would appear that staff is driving it at the Conservation Authority. Okay, but they would still have to follow the direction of the board, I would suspect, and uh, okay. Um, does any of our staff want to respond to that, or is that strictly in the hands of the Conservation Authority? I don't know whether, Al or Gary, do you have anything to add to that? Jerry? Through the chair, no. We. You know, we're ready to build it when we get the direction uh, from public works perspective. So, okay. Well, then we'll we'll go down the speakers list then, and we have uh, Councillor Collins first. So, Mr. Chairman, we have the uh, reports that are in front of us, and then we have the the motion that's to be put as well. So we can ask questions on. on both yeah, it's, it's it's coming for us. So, okay. to expedite things, why don't you ask questions about either or? I, I have uh, fund I have funding questions, and so I, I want to first thank the presenters and uh, Councillor Clark for clearly illustrating some of the growing pains, if you want to call them that, of uh, what's occurring on Stony Creek Mountain. And there are very serious and legitimate concerns, and especially when, when it involves pedestrian safety, I think we should be doing whatever we can to try to expedite work to improve that. So I, my questions are on the, um, the added motion that we have in front of us. And if I'm, I think the cost of the work, when we look at items one through five, is about uh, $380,000 or thereabouts. And in part three of the recommendation, it says that funds advanced from capital projects accounts for the implementation of measures identified above will be placed in 2014 to accommodate previously approved capital works projects. So if I understand that correctly, we're gonna fund these new works that have not been funded through the capital budget process. And we're gonna take projects in 2013 and bump them to 2014, is that correct? Or are these going to be added to works that have already been approved for 2013. Gary? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, the Trinity Church Road is an active project. It has been funded and is a whip right now. It was supposed to start two years ago, so the money is there for that. So I believe what's being proposed here is that the money come be used out of the Trinity Church Road extension project that's on hold pending the Conservation Authority, and then next year in the 214 budget, we'll do whatever we need pop that back up and adjust other projects to fund from this. Yeah, through, so that, through clear, the chair, the, this is also the, cl the closure of well. Mount Upper Mount Abion Road, the temporary traffic control signals, the, the fund, you're saying the funding is already in an account, it hasn't been approved through 213, but the funding is there and, and will not impact 2013 projects. It, it, three years, Chair, it will not affect 213 projects because what we're proposing to do is borrow this out of the Trinity Church Road project, which will not go this year. So the money's just sitting there unused, and we will put it back in next year through the budget process. Okay. And so those then those projects that are in Part D, and I think they add up to around 300000 That's the sidewalks along 2nd Road West, the reconfiguration of the lane markings on Highland Road, and et cetera. Those are now going to be scheduled for a future uh, budget process, 214, I'm assuming, based on what's written here. Mr. Chair, that, that's correct. That's what I... Okay. Thank you. Councilor Jackson. Okay. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman. And um, the, many in the community said it took about 50 years to get the Red Hill Valley Parkway built, and uh, we're about eight, into the eighth year now with this one, so it's still a 42-year difference, but, uh, and I'm being a little bit uh, facetious with my comment, 
But uh, when this was conceived, the uh, Trinity Church Arterial Corridor, Mr. Chairman, back in 06, I was led to believe by all the good intentions of various departments of staff that hopefully within about a five-year period, all EAs would be done and we could start beginning seeing the construction of the Trinity Church Arterial Corridor. And unfortunately, we're not there yet. And there's been um, 11th hour intervention from the Conservation Authority. And you're right, Mr. Chairman. Uh, myself, I'm on that with Councillor Clark and a few other colleagues, uh, Councillor Collins and a couple of others, Pasuda and, and our Chairman McCaddy, along with citizen representatives. And my understanding, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that with the uh, Conservation Authority and the Eco Passage for the white-tailed deer that has anecdotally been observed, but there's no hard data on it, uh, HCA staff would love to build a 75-meter corridor, as Councillor Clark alluded to, but. Uh, the developers up there feel a 35 meters. So we're kind of in between that. And my understanding recently too, Mr. Chairman, is that um, some of our staff, it might have been Gary Moore, it might have been Tony Sergi, it might have been Guy Paprella, along with um, our new CAO of the Conservation Authority, Christopher Thiegel. My understanding is in the last week or so, in light of this uh, state of abeyance that this eco passage has been holding up the Trinity Church Arterial Corridor has been in, that there was a recent on-site meeting in the last week or so, and hopefully some resolution will uh, come of that because, and I think Jerry, to my general manager, Jerry Davis, Jerry, I think maybe in the future, and if we approve this today in the 30-day review period, it might be prudent, Jerry, for your staff to maybe do a presentation from staff in the future to this committee because uh, this, this road, the Trinity Church Arterial Corridor, Mr. Chairman, if it's built, will do so many things, including what the residents of Upper Stony Creek, the constituents of Councillor Clark's primarily, are asking for, which is traffic alleviation from the residentials. It'll open up some more land for commercial, <clears throat> industrial um, tax assessment and growth up in the Red Hill Business Park. And it'll open up some more opportunities for residential while preserving the Aramosa Karst uh, lands and the feeder lands as well. So there's a multitude of getting on with the, what's called the TCAC, the Trinity Church Arterial Corridor. For any of my colleagues that just may not be familiar, this is if you were in a helicopter right atop a Red Hill Valley Parkway where it ends at Paramount Stone Church right on the border of Councillor Clark's Ward and Mine. It'd be like drawing a line right down from the Red Hill Valley Parkway, currently where it ends, right down through Highland Road, right to Rymel Road, and then eventually it's going to zigzag, my understanding, up through the business park, up through Dickinson and Airport Road, connecting with the airport and all the good transportation corridor that we need. So. All of that is the long-term goal, and if I'm wrong in my assessment of it, staff, just put your hand up, uh, any of you, to just say, uh, Councillor, uh, there's a little deviation from what you said, but in my layman's language, that's what I understand uh, the overall benefit of building that. So in the meantime, we got problems, and the secondary plan Councillor Clark has worked so uh, hard on with his constituents and in consultation with staff, myself and Councillor Johnson from Ward 11, that's why we have this uh, additional motion in front of us. So now. After that preamble, and my understanding, Mr. Chairman, through you to Jerry or staff, uh, Pritchard Road, and I'm going to ask very parochially from a Pritchard Road standpoint, I know what's going to happen. Uh, traffic are going to be redirected along Rymel Road and Highland onto Pritchard Road, working towards the closure of Upper Mount Albion Road, which I've supported uh, from back in the days when Red Hill Valley Parkway was uh, being um, conceived, designed, and constructed. That was the ultimate uh, plan, to my knowledge. So. Jerry, Pritchard Road, the stretch of Pritchard Road from Mud to Stone Church uh, was redone uh, by your staff, primarily Paul McShane, beautifully redone from Mud to Stone Church, repaved road improvement, slightly widened a bit, and I can tell you all my constituents were extremely pleased with that road improvement about four years ago. I see here in this yellow sheet, Jerry, on page two, that the uh, number four, that an asphalt overlay on Pritchard where needed be done. Uh, Jerry, I'm going to ask for an amendment, Mr. Chairman, on that because this stretch from Stone Church right to Rymel Road, that's an old rural type of road, a Pritchard Road, and with all this additional traffic, vehicular traffic that now is going to use that stretch of Pritchard Road, uh, redirecting traffic off from the Upper Stony Creek uh, residentials and making them, their, those roads safer. Pritchard Road needs a proper upgrade similar to the stretch that was done a few years ago. 
So, um, Mr. Chairman, through to Jerry or possibly Gary, um, my desire would be on item four to remove the word um, overlay and to delete the words where needed and put an asphalt uh, road upgrade and remove the words where needed, uh, similar to the improvements from mud to stone church. Any comments, Mr. Chairman, through to whichever appropriate staff could, could give me a comment on that, please, because I know the increase of traffic and I know the complaints, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to get on that stretch of pressure from businesses, employees, uh, a few farm homes that are left on perch. I know the complaints I'm going to get. If you're just going to dabble a bit here on the road, dabble a bit there. Mr. Chairman, through you to staff, please. Gary? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, the upgrade that we did on the part north of Stone Church Road, I believe what we did was a uh, pulverize and pave on that. Uh, something similar could be looked at here. Just to keep in mind that once Trinity Church Road extension, arterial, whatever, or how we refer to it, comes and attaches to um, Rymel Road, that, that um, Pritchard Road becomes dead-ended. So the section, you know, we would have some concerns about how much of an upgrade we would do to that road for whatever period of time. We'd, we'd want it to last and try to do the economical upgrade to the point that would get us to where it's closed and the traffic's on the new Trinity. So we'll, we'll look at that. Um, the, between the amount that's there for the shoulder and the amount that's there for the upgrade, I, I think we can be able to do enough that will uh, address your concerns. So Gary, I appreciate that. And even with the ultimate goal of um, dead ending Pritchard Road at Rymel, there'll still be a lot of, Mr. Chairman, internal traffic within the Red Hill Business Park and residents coming and going uh, to the Power Center, Upper Stony Creek, uh, up in my area, along the Albion Falls area as well. In fact, Gary, Mr. Chairman, on the north stretch of Pritchard Road from Stone Church to Mud, the reason why you and your staff are gracious enough to heed my call of needing an upgrade there, I never thought, I never envisioned Pritchard Road would be so, um, so youth, the demand of Pritchard Road would increase upon the Red Hill Valley Parkway opening. I thought uh, cars onto the East Mountain area, business and residential, would have used either Dartnell, would have used either Upper Ottawa, Upper Gage, but an increased amount of traffic, as your stats proved, ended up using Pritchard Road north of Stone Church in a greater way, which led you to appreciate and agree to pulverize and upgrade that stretch. I suspect whether it's for a year, two, three, or four, this stretch of Pritchard is going to get the same type of demand, Gary. So I appreciate, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll put that as an amendment to properly uh, pulverize, just to add that, and, and uh, add that amendment on number four. Number two, Gary, or to us uh, staff um, on traffic, maybe Martin White, Mr. Chairman, through you to Jerry Davis or Martin White on number two, the temporary signal at Pritchard and Rymel. Uh, I'm okay with that. We've just put in a signal light at Glover and Rymel, which was much needed, long overdue. Um, so that's a temporary. Can I ask, depending on, again, how the TCAC construction goes, how long it's going to take, that its removal be done upon a review with the ward councillor before it's actually removed? Mr. Chairman, through you to whoever can possibly answer that, either Martin White, our, our manager of traffic operations, or through the uh, general manager, please, Martin. I don't think I'm putting you on the spot, Martin, because you and I have had discussions about this in the past with you and Ron Gallo and others. Through you, Mr. Chairman, to Martin, please. Martin, nice move coming down there. But, uh, welcome. Thank you. I was hoping I wouldn't trip and land up on the council floor. Um, the short answer is yes, Councillor Jackson, we can do that. Perfect. Thank you, Martin. That's great. And lastly, Mr. Chairman, on item three, Jerry, of the yellow sheet, provision of a paved shoulder along the west side of Pritchard between the strip trail and Stone Church Road. Uh, Cynthia, I'm glad Cynthia Graham is here because I've been working closely with her because we're going to do, Mr. Chairman, a paved pathway that's been approved through Council from the top of Red Hill Valley Parkway uh, Rail Trail through the valley up through Old Mud Road on the east side of Pritchard, cutting across before the overpass into where eventually we'll hook in with the uh, bridge over the link and the East Mountain Trail Loop. So I only see an item three paved shoulder along the west side of Pritchard. Am I misunderstanding that? Because I want to make sure, I thought, Cynthia, we agreed to the east side of Pritchard having a, a paved shoulder for that pathway. Or am I, uh, am I confusing or mixing up two different projects? 
Mr. Chairman, through you to Cynthia, is that to Cynthia, that question? Either Jerry Davis or whoever he, I know Cynthia and I have been working on it, but I just want to make sure, maybe on item three, maybe I'm just mixing up two different projects there. I want to make sure the paved pathway on the east side of Pritchard for the pedestrian cycling is still going ahead. Chairman, through you. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my, the pathway that you're referring to is the East Mountain Trail Loop, and the plan is still to connect the trail from the bridge uh, over the link uh, through the open space across Pritchard um, at a location and carry along to the Mud Street parking lot on the east side of Pritchard. So I don't know um, exactly what number three refers to in this report, but my plan is still the same as we had talked about. Perfect. So this sounds like an addition to. I'm, I just need that confirmation. Thank you, Cynthia. And lastly, Mr. Chairman, through to Jerry Davis, on page three of the overall report, item 8.1, the widening of Rymel Road, Mr. Chairman, to five lanes is long overdue, basically from Dartnell Road all the way to Centennial Parkway. The new BR is opening up. We got more commercial development up in that area. We got new businesses, still re a residential hotbed of development occurring there with Summit Park and others. I got two churches in the area. I've got an Egyptian Coptic church. I've got a Trinity United Church, all staying there for many years to come. So, Jerry, at the top of page three, it says that the widening of the five lanes really hasn't been uh, budgeted for in the 10-year capital plan. Can somebody give me a status on the widening of Rymel Road to five lanes, Mr. Chairman? Through you to Jerry or Gary Moore, please, our director. Gary? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. I believe the, uh, the development engineering is starting that work uh, beginning next year from Dartnell to Fletcher, the five lanes and urbanization as well as all the associated drainage works. Gary, that's wonderful, encouraging news. Is that all in the capital budget? So, or do I have to, Councillor Clark and I have to fight for that money in next year's budget? Through you, Mr. Chairman? Well, through you, Mr. Chair. It was indicated in this year's capital budget for next year, although we only approve a year at a time, so it will simply move in and, and be recommended as, as we usually do. Terrific, Gary. Mr. Chairman, if you'd come back to me just for those couple of minor amendments at the appropriate time. Otherwise, I support uh, both Report 8.1 and the yellow handout as well for all the reasons I've mentioned. Thanks for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Councilor Powers. Yeah, thank you, Councilor Jackson, for helping to um, give some clarification to the migration of the traffic. We had two pre presenters, and obviously, you know, being from the west of the city, I, I couldn't understand. So I thank Councilor Jackson and Councilor. Uh, Clark for that, for providing clarity on the migration and the increase in the numbers. Thank you. Councillor Vall. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And, um, I was uh, listening with uh, interest about the no sidewalks when a new school is being built. So maybe I can ask through you to staff is, um, how are they supposed to get to the school? Is there a pathway there? Is there, if there's no sidewalks, are we, are we making something for them? Mr. Chair, uh, we, we received correspondence from the school board indicating that the uh, children uh, north of Rymel Road will be, will be bused back and forth to school. That's the information we received last week. Okay, um, I, I, I'm really surprised because we have this problem even in my ward uh, on Rymel, um, an Upper Sherman area where we built a school 30 years ago, and it's still in a, in, a, in a rural area. And there was a lot of concerns with the parents about how they were being, their students were being walked to school. We had no pathway for them. They were just running on the side of the road. Um, so I, I, I'm really surprised with all the buildup of this area. And, and I'm hearing that you talk to the school board and the, the, the kids will be bust. Um, I'm not sure if they're all going to be bused, and I'm not sure even when they get out if they're going to be going home by the bus, uh, they go into an area. So w what precautions are we taking for these students to walk to maybe to the mall or wherever they're going to be walking to to have their lunch, especially in the winter time? Um, is there a pathway being invented? Uh, we have to have something for these children. We just can't continue to have children on the side of the road um, especially in those numbers. And I'm really surprised the school board is allowing this and our city to be built, putting schools, because I know the school is coming up in Rymel Road in my area, uh, a new one, and I'm certainly going to be asking for sidewalks there. So I, I, I just, I'm interested, what are our plans to be 
making a pathway or a, a sidewalk for these children? I think, I think it's in the resolution that's being proposed amendment, but uh, I'll let staff answer that. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, uh, again, this, this is a, a, a phased area whereby um, when the Trinity Church corridor is going to be constructed, then the upper middle road was planned to be closed, as indicated, plus the secondary plan in that area is going to be changing the face of, of, of that partic particular area. So um, what, what the plan is is to close upper Mount Albion Road uh, at, at Rymel, uh, so therefore the amount of traffic will be substantially reduced and therefore um, uh, pedestrians will be able to walk on the side of the road, but there is no particular paths to be constructed at this particular time, only when the, the secondary plan moves forward. Yeah, um, again, I'm really surprised here. So I, I'll leave it like that for the, uh, the councillor, but I, I just want to um, let this committee know and the councillor, uh, when this happened to me on Brebuff, I had an outcry um, from the residents in that area because the, the students were walking. He, when they were being bused, they were being dropped off. They had to go into a rural road, go into a ditch, and um, to the satisfaction, we made a temporary pathway, and we made sure that the city plows that pathway um, in the winter time, so our kids have a safety, uh, a safe place to walk. So, I'm I, I'm disappointed when I'm hearing this, and I'm hoping that the new school in my area gets built, or is in Councillor Jackson's, that we're going to have sidewalks for these people to walk on. We cannot continue to allow this to happen. And we have to have better planning because I know it's going to take that my school was built 30 years ago and it's still not there and uh, we keep building the houses around it more kids will be walking to those schools and we have no plan of how to get them there thank you Councilor Marula uh, thank you um, mr. chairman I think firstly let me start off by by really emphasizing I think something that needs to be addressed is that I support what's before us um, One front, and I know it's not relevant, but I think I need to highlight it. The socioeconomic demographics of this school and the catchment area, where it incorporates wards four, five, six, nine, and eleven, <coughs> is really an international model of progression or a progressive model that that really needs to be applauded. Uh, I think far too often we criticize the school board or school board uh, for not uh, thinking in a progressive manner. But in this particular case, if you look at the socioeconomic uh, area. Incorporates, it really is a true reflection of community and not segregation. So that I want to applaud them. On the second front, and along the same lines as what I think Councillor Duval was saying, is that how does a school like this get built without all of the necessary infrastructure being in place for it on opening day? It should be really a one day celebration, but everything should be intact. In so, so, so to you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to Gary, I presume. Uh, how does that happen? How, why? What was what was the missing link? How did we get from from point A to point B uh, without actually um, the synergies existing? Through the chair, Councilor Marullo is absolutely right. So the the planning for the construction and the time to do that construction from public works perspective hasn't changed. So if all the approvals were in place, which they should have been prior. All the questions you're asking, we would have been addressed. The the Rymel Road, the Trinity Church uh, connection, the closing of the of the, uh, the roads at Rymel. So, the length of time we need to do that hasn't changed. What's changed is the, the requirements to get all approvals to do that. And you know, we're working with the uh, growth management and planning and economic development, working with the conservation authority. But it's very important to understand the the time to construct it. If all those approvals were when we had anticipated when the school was going, it would be done. All the infrastructure would be built. So we will get it done in the time we, we've said. The problem is it's a moving time. Ideally, it would have been 2011 and 12, 13, school opens, everything's in place. And if it takes us, if it's an eight-month construction or whatever the number is, Gary can say, that's what we'll build it in. We just need a start date. And that's the frustrating part. And I understand, like, we don't want to see uh, children walking on a road without a sidewalk. We, we want to build them as well. We understand that. So we're, uh, you know, I guess what I'm saying is I can build it. Give me the go-ahead. And that's what we're waiting for. And it's not this council. It's a conservation authority, a number of things. So when Gary gets the green light, you know, 
you get out of Gary's way and he'll get a bell for you. So right. I hope that helps yeah. it. Thank I'm you. just wondering, uh, we could use this as an example uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, of how we can prevent it from happening in the future, uh, where it can be a, simply a turnkey opening, where that everything is intact, turn the key, and the, and the kids can be seamlessly transferred over to the school. Um, so through you at the appropriate time, I'd like to move that we at least assess how we can prevent this from happening in the future and put a plan of action accordingly. So, uh, because I think in times of this, I can see the frustration from, from the public's uh, view. And even my, my own residents who, who will have their children bus to this particular school, I don't think uh, on spare or on their lunch, if they're traveling to and from some of the uh, 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 stores or restaurants in that area, that uh, they should be subject to that type of infrastructure. So I think everyone agrees on that front, and, and being that we all agree on that front, I think we need to put a plan of action to prevent it from happening again in the future, and I look forward uh, to putting, putting forward that motion at the appropriate time, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you very much for your time. Councillor Wade. Thank you. Uh, this clarification it might be better to, as opposed to an information or discussion report to have an actual um, um, presentation, because it begs a lot of questions for me. Uh, one, one uh, obviously, is the uh, the um, funding. My understanding, most of it is development charges. Is that correct? Because they there's a lot of growth. Okay. Through, through the chair, that's correct. It's DC funded. Okay, appreciate that. Um, I, when I heard the person describing Albion uh, Road, I was thinking Queen Street. No so shoulders. I think the only difference is is that there's a higher volume of traffic on Queen Street Hill, and. Uh, but it still goes to a neighbor at 20,000 cars a day. So I'm trying to understand um, when we're talking about limited accesses uh, uh, along the escarpment. And I know that we're going to experience uh, closure with Queen Street Hill this, this summer. It's going to be an absolute nightmare. Um, what I didn't get was um, 10,000 vehicles is the number I heard. If 10,000 vehicles doesn't justify a, uh, the, the need for a road, I don't know what does. But if, if that's the EA uh, has come back and said that's the case, well, I, I accept that. Where are they going? Where's the 10,000 cars going to go? So through the chair, the, the plan is the, the Trinity Church extension will take that traffic. So the, it goes right down to the lower city? It's, it it, it uh, through transverses the, the escarpment? Uh, through the chair, yeah. So the Red Hill Valley Parkway, if you take it to the, the top, instead of take, going onto the link and go directly to Stone Church, Paramount, it will continue right through to Rymo Road. So all that traffic right now that hits the the end of the Red Hill Valley Parkway, it's it's like a spider web, goes east, Stone Church, uh, High, or Pritchard, it, um, Upper Mount Albion, goes into the where the all the shopping centers and the restaurants are there, or it heads west along Stone Church over to Second Road West off of Highland. So it's I, I describe it as a spider web. And what this will do is take that traffic and focus it on the Trinity Church ex, uh, extension to Rymo. Uh, now, some people will obviously still go the other way. They may live there, so that's the access. But the through traffic will be concentrated. And I, I don't, I've seen the traffic studies, but that's where the, the majority will be because you're going to have the, the uh, Glenbrook or the um, Red Hill Industrial Business Park and with Rymo expanded where the businesses are. So the traffic will be localized on that road versus going through the neighborhoods, which is the issue. Well, I mean, there's 20,000 cars going through a neighborhood on the West Mountain, but staff hasn't come and made a recommendation to close it down. So I'm just trying to understand what the, uh, uh, to me, what justifies the road? 10,000 cars a day doesn't justify the road? I'm trying to understand uh, uh, um, how do you come to arrive at, I guess my concern is when you start closing, um, um, and there's only limited amount of accesses between the lower city and, and, and the mountain. When you start limiting uh, even one, uh, it has a net impact. And if you have a, uh, some kind of a crisis on, on the Red Hill or, or whatever, then you're putting an additional burden on what limited accesses are left. Uh, and, and often, through many traffic studies, I, I've always told that uh, um, the, the reason why you have these secondary uh, routes is it, it gives an alternative when you have those kinds of issues. You're closing that, that alternative off altogether. Um, on Albion Road, so and, I, and, and what you explained might be, uh, it's hard to visualize because I don't see the cross-section maps to, to, to get a clear indication what transverses down the mountain, and it might make perfect sense. Problem is I didn't get a, the benefit of presentation, uh, Mr. Chair. I'll be supporting it before, so it's just uh, begging the question, because um, I mean, I get a lot of pressure from people, why 
that live on uh, Gar Street and in those neighborhoods, Alkmaar, close down Queen Street Road. It's it's driving us crazy. The traffic volumes are driving and you can cut through through uh, through Alkmaar, for example, and Bramley, and and they're looking at me and saying close it down. Twenty thousand cars, and I'm hearing now that we're going to close off a, a road of ten thousand. So, I just try and understand. Um, that how the road network would work. So I would go offline. I'm supporting. I, I mean, I believe the EA's probably determined that. I just didn't have the benefit of seeing the, the mapping and how that would be dispersed. But it's always concerning, Mr. Chair, when uh, uh, an access to the mountain anywhere is closed because it does create a, an alternative when there are uh, issues that, uh, like construction, for example. Okay. Yeah. Go to second time speakers now, Councillor Clark. I want to thank everyone around the table for their, their comments and questions. Uh, a few things that I got out of it, which um, I think is really important for this council and for the city, is to fully understand the timing of the construction for the Trinity Church extension. Um, we're in a situation where BR will be opening later this year. Um, I think Councillor Councilor Marula's comments. I, I I take very directly. He, he's those are some of the concerns I've been raising for the last few years. That's exactly what's been happening. How did we get to this point without these this infrastructure in place? Rymel Road, for example, was supposed to be a five-lane road four years ago, with sidewalks before this high school would have ever been built. But it didn't happen. Um, how we got where we are right now with the school, I can tell you part of it was not the staff's uh, issue or the city, it was the province. They gave money to the school board for the construction of the high school and they were not willing to um, slow down on the time frame. They said you must get it done within this time frame. So it's been jammed forward faster than the city could catch up with the other infrastructure. Um, as a matter of fact, the closing of Upper Mount Albion, which Councillor Whitehead had indicated a, as a concern, um, it wasn't supposed to close until um, the Trinity West extension was open. So one would close, one would open. But therein lies the problem for our staff when it comes to safety. No sidewalks up by the high school. Thousands of kids going to this high school. We know that although they're bused to school, that you can't force them on a bus. We know that most high school, the kids leave the property, although they're told not to leave the property at lunch, they do. And within seven minutes, they'll be down the street to all the best fast food restaurants there are in the mountain. So we were quite concerned as a staff and as citizens, how these kids are gonna get up and down Upper Mount Albion, as Councillor Duvall indicated. Um, and we knew that if we didn't get that road closed early, that there was going to be a tragedy or two because of the amount of traffic. Because there are no sidewalks. And you're quite literally, in some areas, it's like eight inches of, of stone beside you before you fall into a ditch that's three feet down. So um, it's, it's just not a good situation overall. Um, I would remind everyone around here that the Trinity Church extension has been long planned and it's supposed to, or originally the plan was to connect to the mid pen corridor. If you go back and look at the original transportation needs assessment for Niagara, the west, west, uh, the, uh, the mid pen, the Trinity Church extension from the Red Hill goes all the way up and connects to the new highway that would go east west over to, to our airport. So all of these are, are, are pivotal in terms of our infrastructure. Um, the real challenge is to make sure that it gets done in a timely manner because the last thing we want, in my humble opinion, and I know Councilor Jackson's concerned about it too, is having Upper Mount Albion closed, Trinity Church not open for two or three years because of problems. We're going to have detour traffic all over the place. And so we, we need to expedite this. Um, and with regards to the Conservation Authority, um, and what has not been brought up here today is that in order to build a 75 meter um, eco passage, we need to move a wetland. Not an easy thing to do, given that we're not God. So trying to engineer the moving of a wetland in order to allow for the widening of this passageway is really some significant engineering that we are contemplating. 
Um, and I have real concerns that, that we're going to try and wrestle this thing to the ground for the eco passage. It will not be done in time. We will throw Upper Stony Creek into traffic chaos for three years, as opposed to saying, listen, enough is enough. We tried to look at the passage. There's no need for it. We're moving ahead with the, the, the uh, Trinity Church extension. So I would encourage my colleagues to support this. I know Councillor Jackson had some uh, very good um, additional amendments to it, and Councillor Marula, uh, is planning on moving that motion, I would completely agree with it. In the future, we must have a more, co more cohesive process. It, it, ju it just can't be, let's get this done, and then we'll catch up later on on something else, because as, as you, you can see now, this becomes the chaos that we're left with that no one is happy with. So. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councilor Jackson, I had you down as the next second night speaker, but I believe that was for an amendment to the to the, to the amendment. So I'm going to come back to you later. I, I think Councilor White, did you have one more thing on this? Well, uh, just on the second part, I appreciate the clarification. I've seen the map, so now I appreciate the uh, uh, what's planned. It just did, without the pres benefit of the presentation, it was hard to uh, envision. The, uh, I guess my concern, whether it's through a motion or not, um, a number of years ago, uh, St. Therese Lisieux. Uh, when it was a new school being built, I raised the same issues in regards to the infrastructure. We had no paths, no sidewalks. We actually put an asphalt path to temporarily put in. We, at the time, we had the school board liaison committee as well, and, and, and at that time, I, I highlight the fact that we need to coordinate all new schools with infrastructure so we ensure that the, uh, uh, the, the, the pedestrian uh, pathways and that were all in place. That was like three or four years ago, so we didn't learn anything from that. And I guess it concerns me because uh, I highlighted then, and I believe it was through uh, a motion at the time, so we're reiterating something that, uh, that was banged through then. So I, we do have the school board liaison committee, Mr. Chair, and there should be coordinating all new uh, school programs. Uh, so I would suggest whatever motion is here is also forward to that particular committee. Okay, I'm going to start the motions going now. So I think we first have to get the staff recommendation on the floor, then I'll go for the amendments. Okay, moved by Councillor Powers. Actually, I'm going to move the staff recommendation, including C and D, being the motion before us. Okay, can we do both at the same time, uh, Mr. Clerk? I think sure, we can. Sure, we can. Uh, yes, yes, we can. Uh, if we could just get some, some clarification on, on C, C and D. Though. So you're moving yeah. the staff. So I'm moving staff 8 recommendation .1. and the amendment that Councillor Clark had before us. Correct. So parts A and B is the staff recommendation, and the inclusion of parts uh, C. C and D and move by myself, second by Councillor Jackson. Okay, um, now go to Councillor Jackson for your amendment to the amendment. So on page two of the yellow sheet, item two, uh, Martin White agreed that at, after the words cost of 79,000 for the temporary light of Pritchard Rymel, uh, before its removal, a review be done with, by staff with the ward councillor. That's number one, seconded by Councillor Whitehead. All in favor of that amendment? Carried. Carried. And the second one on item four, in consultation with Gary Moore, provide an asphalt on Pritchard Road just to remove the words where needed. So delete the words where needed. Seconded by Councillor Duval. Okay, Thanks, discussion on that motion. Staff okay with it? All in favor? Carried. Now Thanks, to, Mr. To Chairman. The main motion then, uh, all in favor? Carried. Opposed? That motion carries. Now, uh, do you want to do it on notice as a motion or do you? Okay, just ask him. Do it there? Okay. I want to presentations, and I understand Daryl Smith. Is he going to do the presentation, or Brian, or are you going to do it on Summer Road program? Yes, on there real soon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Here to talk about summer roads. I am, and hopefully, I'll just get a second to get it up here. Andy, can you close the dome the rest of the way so we can see the screen? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of committee. 
I am pleased to provide you uh, this overview of the road maintenance services summer programs. So our winter control and, and winter maintenance is not included in this presentation, though I understand I'll be back here in the fall to do one on those. Um, I will try to be brief throughout this presentation, but I'm going to try to convey a, a fair amount of information. So the intent of this presentation is to provide an overview of the division's maintenance services for the municipal right-of-way, which are roadways, and our stormwater management infrastructure as part of the transportation and environmental programs within our asset inventory. So the overview uh, builds on the program and the services review document and uh, budget submissions for 2013 and it will be presented in the context of uh, scope of services, activities management model, improvement initiatives and challenges and opportunities. So I'm going to talk about the right-of-way or roadway maintenance first. Our service objective in the right-of-way infrastructure maintenance is to ensure safe public access to municipal transportation infrastructure through planned operating and capital programs and emergency works, so efficiently and effectively servicing a wide range and scale of inventory, as you can see here. We've all had these numbers before, 6,400 lane kilometers of roadway, 390 bridges and structures, cycling infrastructure, uh, it is a not only vast network in the uh, types of infrastructure that it's serviced, it's vast in the area that it's serviced as well. Our core activities can be categorized into four groups, safety, infrastructure maintenance, infrastructure preservation, and aesthetics. So I'm not going to go through everything, but safety is sort of removal of roadway ha hazards would be a safety activity. Infrastructure preservation, catch basin repair. Um, obviously maintenance would be sweeping, grass cutting, and aesthetics is just that, cleaning up litter and, and graffiti. We also have, in addition to the services that the public sees, there are a vast number of support activities that are, aren't seen. And without these, we would not be able to deliver the services that are seen. They include program and activity planning, program and resource management, performance management, continuous improvement, work planning and customer service. I guess the, the nature of the, mes uh, the, the message, underlying message here is that the nature of our services and the context of the environment in which we deli deliver them requires a tremendous amount of support and a tremendous amount of planning citywide. Touch base on stormwater infrastructure maintenance, which is another key aspect of what's delivered through operations. Similarly to the right-of-way activities, our main objective or mission for maintaining stormwater management infrastructure is to ensure optimal function of the municipal stormwater infrastructure to minimize risks of flooding through plan inspection, maintenance and capital rehabilitation programs, and effectively and efficiently serving a significant inventory of features, again as summarized here. Over 1,700 kilometers of ditches, 140 storm ponds, stormwater management ponds, of course, water courses, outfalls, inlets, catch basins, and culverts. And again, these core activities are broken down into four areas, safety, infrastructure maintenance, drainage superintendent and drainage act functions, and of course, asset management. So the activity management model, I'd like to spend a few slides on this. Uh, this has been implemented within the operations uh, division and is a fairly straightforward management model. It's the plan, do, check model, which you see here, and is used to manage the delivery of services and our subservices. So the additional step of innovation or continuous improvement allows us to review what we've completed, make sure that we have address any hiccups that we come across, and plan for the next business cycle, to taking out the problems that we've had in the previous business cycle. So by following this type of model, 
uh, every service and every activity should get better and better each time we go through the uh, cycle. So we plan to optimize our effectiveness and our efficiency and to avoid chaos and inefficiency. As you can imagine with the number of staff, large area and diverse activities, um, it requires a lot of planning. So to facilitate planning, excuse me, to facilitate planning, activities are basically characterized as scheduled, unscheduled or emergency works. The determination of what works are performed each and every day depends on the schedule and how it is impacted by events beyond our control, such as large rainstorms, uh, car accidents, police and fire emergencies all have an impact and require resources from public works to help address the situation. And even though we have work that is unscheduled and emergency, and by its very nature is reactive, that doesn't mean we don't plan for this work. We plan the how to do it, we just don't know when we're gonna to have to do it. So generally speaking, a robust program of scheduled works will increase customer satisfaction and will have a, a higher program value than a program that is completely reliant on reactive works. So now the do. Whether the services are delivered by inside staff or by contractors, works are regulated by a large range of policies, regulations, and compliance to these is a key deliverable. So I'm not gonna read them all, but we've listed some of the regulations and acts that basically govern our everyday life. This is over and above the service delivery policies that this committee and has passed and, and uh, that also uh, we strive to achieve. Our maintenance management system, Hansen, which we talked, we will talk about a little more in, in a little bit, is used to plan work, track costs, accomplishments, and provide a maintenance his history. So as we're doing the work, we're actually gathering the data to help us plan the work. The check. We look for two things, quality and accountability. So the quality insurance is uh, making sure that the service are delivered to meet the requirements of the service level, the corporate policies, legislation, contract specs, standard operating positions, uh, sorry, procedures, supervision and, and customer feedback. That is all taken into account. That is all the things that we, we check. And depending on what, um, what quality we are looking for will depend on the management oversight that is required. We also have an accountability model where we hold the supervisors accountable to deliver the program in most cases, whether it, again, whether it's done in-house or with contracted services. We have second level oversight through the superintendents. We have a performance management process where we check performance measures. We check performance tar targets and we check the indicators. Are we meeting those measures? Are we meeting those targets? And finally, we have a management level oversight that looks at the program as a whole. And the final part of our model is innovation. While progress is being made through various initiatives, developing a workplace culture that is focused on continuous improvement through innovation is critical for this model to succeed. Investing in learning, encouraging experimentation, tolerating risk, and recognizing success are essential ingredients to a stronger creative and innovative culture within the division. Recent innovations have brought improved value to the program and our various stages of implement, implementation. Um, rather than going through all of them, as you can see we have a quite a list here, I'd like to uh, highlight the recent implementation of the revised road patrol system. As it is fundamental to our work and it helps identify work, uh, our management process and success. So the Road Patrol, I'm going to touch a little bit on the background and then 
just highlight a few things that, uh, with respect to the patrol program. The implementation of the road, road patrol initiative started in 2011 and the patrollers were hired and put in place in 2012. So this will be the first full budget year where we'll have the patrollers in place and have that input into our activity cycle. So what is road patrol? It is a systematic inspection of all roadways within the city based on a schedule determined by the Highway Traffic Act and the minimum maintenance standards. So as an example, uh, priority one roads such as the link, must be uh, inspected three days in every seven. And it's seven calendar days, not seven business days. So three days out of every seven, a road patroller must drive that route. So this inspection, when the road patroller completes it, will identify deficiencies. Some of them will be MMS compliant deficiencies, and some of them will be deficiencies but don't necessarily um, are not necessarily MMS compliant, sorry, minimum maintenance standards compliant. Anything that is minimum maintenance standard compliant, there is a regulated time frame to complete the work. Again, as an example, priority one roads, any minimum maintenance standard deficiency that is identified has to be repaired within four working days. Each of our districts has two dedicated road patrollers and they are equipped with GPS and mobile computers in their vehicles. When they come upon a deficiency, they enter it directly into Hanson from their road patrol location. And the GPS is tagged to that work order. That creates the work order for the ward supervisor. So there's no paperwork back flow back within the district. It happens immediately, automatically using the computer technology to create the work order for the ward supervisor right on the spot. The ward supervisor then can then schedule the repair based on whether it's MMS compliant or whether it's some other repair that goes on to a, a deficiency list that will be repaired at an at appropriate time. <clears throat> the data used to develop our program from a simple reactive maintenance activities to rehabilitation and we use it to do asset life extending activities such as crack sealing. So all of this information goes into our program to help us plan our program for the following months, weeks, years, et cetera. In addition, we are working with our friends in asset management to find a way to feed this information into their decision-making process for when they're making decisions on capital improvements. So challenges and opportunities. We continue to be challenges, challenged in familiarity, fam, uh, sorry, familiar areas, performance optimization, workforce optimization, sustainable program resources, climate change and aged infrastructure. Climate change is very significant. It is uh, causing much more severe weather, higher intensity type storms. Uh, and when they happen, they don't happen in the way the traditional storms happen. So all of this is requiring us to uh, alter our approach to deal with it not only in how we uh, maintain our infrastructure, but also how we plan our infrastructure. The opportunities that present themselves are also not new, but they require continued resolve to make sure that they are continuing and that we can benefit from them and to achieve service excellence, which is our goal. The simple process of plan, do, check, and innovate allows us to meet our challenges and realize our opportunities. So I want to, first off, thank uh, Brian Scheinel, Nancy Wunderlich, and Jennifer Atkinson for helping prepare this uh, presentation. Without them, that would have not have happened. But I also want to thank the committee for having me here today and allowing me to present this to you. Thank you, Darrell. We got a bunch of questions. So uh, I'll start with uh, Councillor Whitehead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, um appreciate the presentation and uh, certainly on paper it looks like you covered all the bases and, and I appreciate that. Um, I guess the, the first question I have is um, I've had a number of calls and in fact being on, on site where uh, uh, potholes are being filled for example and, uh, and, and I get a lot of comments too. too. There's one, we, I guess we've got some machinery that uh, we have, I don't know, 250 and we're buying one more or two more. 
Uh, and I've been told by the front lines that uh, there's a real issue, and I don't know if it's with the machinery or the product, which brings me back to the, 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 the real issue is, is uh, again, a lot of complaints from front line and type of product we're using on Nashville uh, for pot uh, uh, holes that uh, uh, they're not adhering, they're not sticking, and they, as soon as they put it in within the same day, they could be uh, completely blown out of those holes. So I'm trying to figure out uh, from the, um, if the front lines are ex experience this information, how does it flow up to management, and are we addressing the products that we're using? So actually, uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, um, we have a working group in place on the asphalt issue. Uh, that includes the frontline staff who are making the asphalt, uh, up to uh, through to management uh, and through to our director. Uh, we are addressing the issues. There have been quality issues, and for the most part, the quality issues with the recycled asphalt is based on the quality of the material that we get to to use to recycle. Um, so the first process improvement that we've put in place is we're now sourcing the material that we're going to use to recycle. We're not just taking any and all. We're taking material that's going to give us the best material to put back on the road. We also use uh, fresh asphalt that is purchased from an asphalt plant depending on the application because there are some applications that the asphalt recycling uh, material it will not ever be suitable for. And so we recognize that and we still use uh, virgin asphalt in those instances. I appreciate that, and, and the other uh, area is, and I don't know if that falls under you or wastewater, but we get road cuts. Uh, on, and, I mean, I just went over one yesterday on Stone Church, brand new resurfaced road, and, and we're already into road cuts. Uh, and the road cut is like a, a, a significant speed bump. I mean, a lot of times there's depression. Well, this one's actually uh, elevated. So, you, you know, you come off that, you're, uh, you're doing any speed, you're, you're flying. So I'm trying to understand who's doing the, uh, the um, supervision or the, the quality control to ensure that those issues are being addressed. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, we work with asset management. They have a program in place to deal with the rope cuts, to track them, to track who's responsible for them. But if it is an MMS, MMS compliant issue or an emergency issue, we will go out and deal with them with city forces. So uh, um, either it's covered off one of, th one of those two ways. What kind of timelines are we looking at then when it's identified as an issue that we can actually, uh, well, what is our standard uh, after road cut is done? Uh, that we ensure that it's, um, um, when it's resurfaced, that it's in fact on par with the balance of the roadway. Are you talking the temporary one or the permanent restoration? I'm talking about the permanent now. Okay. Great. Okay. Was the timeline between the temporary and the permanent? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. The, from the time that we get notified that the, who's ever made the cut is done with their, their work, it's, it's eight weeks um, under our contract to give our contractor to get it permanently fixed. Just through you, Mr. Chair, the, um, the unfortunate part of when we do a resurfacing is that if there is a sewer break or a service, you know, problem, a lateral problem, or a, or um, that the homeowner hasn't come forward before that with a low pressure or lead service replacement, that we have to go out and respond to that. So, I mean, those were the chances that we took when we did the resurfacing. The, um, once we have those, we've incorporated all of that work into our response for that. The initial person that makes the cut is responsible for the temporary work until we get there and to maintain it. Sometimes, as you have noted, they overfill the cut to make sure that they don't have to go back. Uh, the reciprocal of that is an underfilled cut, which is a pothole. So. Um, we, we try to do some sort of quality control on the temporary, um, and we do, con like Daryl said, uh, coordinate with them. If if we can't get them back out right away, and it is a safety hazard, then then roads crews will do that, and that will be charged through to the person that that initiated the cut initially. I think it's important because I, I believe I have now two risk management claims based on road cuts and, and depressions. Uh, that cause damage to the vehicle. So uh, um, I think it's important that we, we address it in a timely fashion. And uh, in the presentation, this is my last question, uh, just a clarification. You talked about uh, maintenance something, compliance standards. Uh, 
but you didn't cite any real examples. So I wanted to be able to understand and distinguish between what falls into that category versus what doesn't fall into that category. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So um, I don't have the exact numbers, but I'll give you an example. So for a pothole to be MMS compliant, it has to be a certain size and a certain depth. Um, and basically, I, I'm sure the provincial government, when they, they put the minimum maintenance standards together, uh, calculated all this out, depending on the speed of the highway and all that, the likelihood that that pothole would cause damage. So on, on the link, you're probably looking at something six, 10 inches across and, and two or three inches deep. So that would be an MMS compliant issue where we'd have to go to deal with it. So we might actually have another pothole just further up the road that's only three inches across and maybe a, a, you know an inch deep. It, it is a roadway deficiency. It does have to be dealt with, but it's not an MMS compliant issue because it's not a safety issue with respect to either the vehicles or the pedestrians. Appreciate the clarification. Thank you. Councillor Powers. Thank you. I'm just going to segue perhaps onto the question about the, the, the road cuts and that. Um, is there a single point of contact? Um, I, I think if there is, I think we need to be shared with all of us, in particular our administrative assistants. If we see something, I, I have one that's on King Street West in Dundas, right by the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce. It obviously was a, uh, I'm going to say, a, um, a water repair. Um, it sunk, it's eight, eight inches deep, it's been like that now for two and a half weeks. Would that have been picked up by the road patrol or is a, is a road patrol in place now, Mr. Smith? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, the road patrol is in place. Uh, I have no doubt that it was picked up by the road patrol okay. and might have been uh, uh, put through to uh, the process to getting it replaced. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, but I appreciate if there's a single, I'm gonna call it email address or, or whatever so that ourselves or uh, our AAs can, uh, I'm going to say, pass on the, those points and I'll make it easier for all. So I respectfully ask that. Um, in your presentation, I see something that you highlighted and I'll just ask the question in, in, in view of the public works issue that we had to deal with recently about uncompleted work. Does the new process that you've introduced here um, will, I'm going to say, reduce and ideally eliminate any of those uh, potentials. So through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, I will have to say that this was the process in place that helped us deal with the issue. This was what helped us to find out that there was an issue in the first place and then take the action to deal with it. Okay, wonderful. Um, partnerships or relationships, as you know, Dundas is below the escarpment and below the CN rail lines. Um, I have issues of drainage coming underneath the train tracks and, and finding them way down in the valley. Um, what's the relationship with CNR? My past experience, there isn't any. They ignore it after it's been built and it's left to ourselves to deal with the, um, you know, the filling of the, uh, the, the culverts and the, and the overflows and things like that. Can you, um, can you point me that we can direct our concerns to CNR and then in turn copy you or does it go to you and then uh, copy to CNR or go to you and we forget about CNR because they're going to do nothing anyway? Well, through you, Mr. Chairman, we, we try to work with all uh, partners that we come across within the roads, whether it be the railways or the conservation authorities. Um, I would say that your uh, best course of action would be to uh, to copy us so that we can be involved and to do the follow-up with CN. Um, my final issue, and they kind of dovetail together, is, is uh, access by councillors and their staff to Hanson and Amanda. We've asked for uh, that and the city manager has indicated that it will take place. Um, we want to be able to see it. We do not want access or editorial rights to it but where an issue has been raised by ourselves or, or raised by a constituent, we'd like to know kind of what's happening and, uh, and perhaps I'd like an update report at Public Works as to when we will be able to get access to Hanson and Amanda. Which is a segue into your road patrol, Daryl, is I think when, they're, when we've got that ability, uh, I know myself and all my colleagues we're out visiting at requests of our, uh, our constituents. 
but we're out driving our own streets to see particular issues. And uh, I think the, if the ability for us to send in SOSs or, or be able to pull up an address and, uh, and add a footnote to it, I think would be, would be helpful. So I, would, uh, I think we could complement the efforts of your road patrol because we know our roads equally as well as yourselves. That's just more an editorial Oh, Darrell, can you give that. us an update? Uh, if, are you making a move to allow councillors to have access to Amanda and Henson? Ed? Oh, Dan. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, yeah, the uh, migration to version 8 uh, of Hanson is uh, well underway, and we are hoping to be able to uh, conduct an orientation session with any members of council that wish to or your admins, uh, hopefully in June. We're, we're hoping that customer service will be available in June. There's two phases that will occur after that, but um, one of the challenges is that all the different operating groups have different workflows and they, they all look different in Hanson, so that's going to be a bit of a challenge, but we're confident that uh, with the new look and feel of Hanson and some of the reports that we think we'll be able to generate out of Hanson, it'll be uh, beneficial for you folks to have that kind of visibility. Thank you. Um, Councillor Jackson. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Daryl, I can't remember the last time I received, uh, had a presentation uh, by uh, staff on road maintenance service overview and so thoroughly done as well. So, Brian, to you as director and manager, uh, Daryl, thank you very much. I found it very, very beneficial here today. Um, Daryl, on uh, slide five, um, your um, plan, do, check, innovate, active management model um, slide there. And I just want to understand, thank you. So the MMS, minimum maintenance. And all the years I've been here, I still find it a bit of a blurry line between asset renewal, um, water, wastewater, now Hamilton water, um, and roads maintenance. So. I'm trying to understand, and I think I, in a recent email to, and that's why I copy when I often do this, like on Upper Gage, uh, from Fennel to Queensdale, and recently on Miles Road, from Rymel to 20, I think I often copy you, uh, Gary Moore, Richard Andoga, Dan McKinnon, all three of you, because those two stretches of road, and just to use them as quick examples, Mr. Chairman, to get a comment from Daryl, those two stretches, if you drove them today, the asphalt is peeling away. There's major depressed areas. It's somewhat dangerous to drive on. Um, and yet, I'm never sure as to whether that's more of an asset renewal, and I've got to work on a future year in the capital budget. But if any of you fine professionals were to drive those two roads right now, I think you'd see what my constituents and I mean. So where's the crossover, Daryl? Can you give your best professional answer to that, Mr. Chairman, through you to Daryl? Where's that crossover from you versus handing it off to Gary Moore uh, Asset Renewal? Mr. Chairman, through you to Daryl for a comment, please. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman. So basically, we're responsible for the MMS compliance. So just because asphalt is breaking up doesn't necessarily mean that it's become non-compliant in the minimum maintenance standards. Uh, understanding that the minimum maintenance standards for the most part address risk. That's why they were put in place. It's a, it's a risk management model that if the municipality follows it, it, it allows us to minimize our risk and exposure when, when a deficiency is noted. Um, so there's things that, yes, make the road bad to drive, and yes, look bad, but they're not minimum maintenance standard requirement repairs. So that's where we come in. We go in and we deal with the minimum maintenance standards. We also do some rehabilitation work, and we work closely with asset management to do that. And there, it, there is, and I'll be honest, there is a blurry line between what is a major rehabilitation and what it is, is an asset renewal. So, so we're working together. We have regular meetings together with asset management staff to deal with those larger issues that when the line is blurred, we get together and we decide, well, which side of the line is it on? Um, it's not necessarily, uh, you know, we try to be consistent, but there's always one or two that slip on one side of the line versus the other. Um, so that's, I guess, the best explanation that I could give. Thank you for the sincerity of that message, Daryl. And it sounds like, 
at least with regular communication between divisions, um, that's most important and critical. And so things aren't falling between the chairs and then the councillor months later or a year later are following up and saying whatever happened to. So that's good. Um, and by the way, to Gary Moore and Dan McKinnon, Mr. Chairman, that whole thing now coming under Gary's area for the road cuts through Hamilton Water, I have found uh, it has been a tremendous improvement both on the rapidness of the road cuts being properly repaired um, as well as the, uh, the quality of the repair being done and the waiting list uh, being reduced in, uh, uh, in a much more efficient manner. So, I, and Gary had said about a year ago that hopefully that would occur by this time this year and it has been. Last question, Mr. Chairman, through to Daryl. Daryl, I'm going to ask you a blunt question because it's been whispered around town. Since 2012, we've had an in-house asphalt recycling program. And I'll tell you, both within the department and just the everyday person on the street, I've heard mixed messages about our own in-house asphalt recycling program. I've heard that from people, the product ain't that great. I've heard it ain't bad. I've heard, why do we ever have it? I heard, well, it's good we have it because at least that way we've got in-house stuff that we can quickly get out on a road, patch up a spot. Through you, Mr. Chairman and Darrell, maybe a comment on that, please. <clears throat> Through you, Mr. Chairman, um, I think I have clearly said we've had some difficulties with the asphalt recycler. It has been uh, a learning curve for both the staff that are um, producing the asphalt and for the supervisors that are using the asphalt. So one of the issues we had originally is that they were trying to use the recycled asphalt for everything. And it's clearly not suitable for certain applications. And so we are making sure that we are using that material for appropriate use. The other thing that we're doing is we're going back to the basics with our staff, both at the supervisory level and the, and the operator level, to ensure that um, we are doing the work properly so that it's not a workflow issue that's making the asphalt bad. And what I mean by that is if we don't properly prepare the hole, and we don't properly uh, tamp the material down at the end, then it doesn't really matter what asphalt we use, it's going to pop out and it's not going to be any good. So we want to make sure that we address the workflow issues and the material issues simultaneously so the end that this corporation gets good value for the process that's put in place. I will say that many cities have, have adopted this, more in the US than in Canada. Um, but Ottawa, London, they have both have very successful asphalt recycling programs. We are in contact with those people on a, I don't want to say regular basis, but we have tapped into their knowledge to improve our program, and we will continue to do so. So it sounds like, Daryl, that you say that as of this moment and based on the improvements you're working on, there's still more advantages versus disadvantages to the corporation having an in-house program. Mr. Chairman, through you to Daryl. Through you, Mr. Chairman, yes. Okay. Thanks so much, Daryl and Brian. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And just on that, Daryl, does your recycler also make a virgin mix, or is it 100% recycled? Through you, uh, Mr. Ch to Mr. Chair, there's no 100% recycled. It, it can't use a blend of 50% virgin. Okay. Uh, no. Um, Councilor Collins. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and uh, like Councilor Jackson's comments, Daryl, a very good presentation. It's not often that we receive um, sort of the nuts and bolts um, summary of really the basic services that we provide. So it, it is refreshing to see something like this in front of committee. Um, two questions. Um, first question being the um, road patrol is certainly not something that's new for us. We have hundreds of vehicles on the road every day from all different departments and different divisions. And I think something that's, uh, that's a pet peeve for most people is Especially when you're on one of the main streets, you're, you're driving down a street and you see something that's sort of uh, out of place, whether it's a pothole, a sign that's missing or down, a garbage and debris that's on the side of the road, and then you, you're back the next day and you see the same thing, and, and, and so to see that it's left unaddressed or unattended, I think what bothers the, the community at large and certainly a pet peeve of mine is that I, I know that on certain streets we have, as I said before, dozens of passes from our own vehicles that would see the exact same thing that I see and others see. The, how are we sort of um, training our staff to ensure that although that may not be their responsibility to remove graffiti, if it's a parks guy that's on his way to, uh, or their a crew's on their way to a certain park to cut the grass and they see that public infrastructure has been tagged, um, 
are we <coughs> trying to bless you? We're we trying to train our staff to ensure that these items are addressed in a, in a timely fashion, knowing that we're all on the same team, so to speak, and we all have the same goals and objectives, and that's certainly to provide you know quali quality services. Um, but at the same time, we're all, I think, concerned about the city's image and, and many of the issues that I've written down here, graffiti, garbage and debris, you know, de <coughs> deteriorating sidewalks, deficient signage. I mean, that's, as I said, that's kind of the basic nuts and bolts. And to know that we have those employees driving by them on a right, regular basis and they're not addressed, I think is concerning for a lot of people. So how are we dealing with those issues, knowing now that we have road patrols that are out specifically looking at the condition of our streets? There are all kinds of municipal issues that or certainly go beyond the, um, I guess, the infrastructure that uh, we're driving on. So any comment on, on that in terms of how we might address some of these ongoing complaints that we get? And usually the resident starts with, Jesus, this issue has been here for two or three weeks on, let's say, Centennial Parkway, and I, I'm not certain why someone hasn't addressed it from the city because your buses are down that street, your public works vehicles, your, you know, and the list goes on. Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Specifically with the road patrollers first. So the road patrollers are their job is to look for MMS deficiencies However, they have been told and trained that any other deficiency that they spot They they should note it. It wouldn't go into Hanson So it wouldn't go create a work order, but note it and let's get it in and get it to the to the right group to deal with whether it's roads or waste or uh, traffic transportation whatever so we can try to share that information I can't speak to any other staff, but I'm sure through every division they're all doing the same thing. We're trying to convey that message to our staff, not just our frontline staff, because our supervisors are out on the roads as well. Convey that message that when they spot things, make sure you note it. You know, all you have to do is radio it in. You don't have to worry about getting it to the right person. Just radio it in, and whoever's on the other end of the radio will get it to the right person. So that is uh, obviously an ongoing improvement and an ongoing culture shift that we're still working towards, but we are trying to make strides in that area. Thanks for that. The, uh, the other common request that I get from, from residents relates to our maintenance activities, and it's not just maybe the schedule of, you know, how often do you cut the grass at the parks or, you know, when do you decide to send the snow plows out. The other one is sort of... Um, you know, very specific as it relates to, you know, when was our sewer last uh, video camera? When was the last time the city cleaned my catch basin in front of my par, uh, in front of my uh, residence? Um, you know, how old is the infrastructure on my street? When is it scheduled to be replaced? And so, is there an opportunity for us to start to uh, post some of the maintenance um, activities that you have? It's not just the standard; it's the actual findings. And so, you know, maybe we could post online that, um, you know, Centennial Parkway has been videotaped, the sewers have been videotaped, uh, you know, six times in the last 10 years. These are the years that they were done. Maybe we don't need to put the exact dates down. Here are the dates that the catch basins on a certain street have been done. I mean, I, I know that might be a little labor intensive, but it, it goes a long way, I think, to assure the public that s these things have not gone sort of unnoticed or, or they haven't been forgotten especially when we're dealing with some of these large storm events. And, um, and I think it shows that the city's been pro proactive. And I think we do a very poor job of advertising many of the services that you've just highlighted in, in your brief presentation. And, and so knowing that we have a community that is so engaged in many ways um, in terms of adopting new technologies and they're, they're very computer savvy, is there a way for us to start posting some of your findings and some of the results that you've seen um, through certain neighborhoods or parts of the city to ensure that um, the public is aware of the fact that, you know, the job is being done and, and these are the times that, or dates that uh, they were accomplished. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, I, I don't, I, that's something that I obviously would have to, oh, and Jerry's picking up the mic, I'm hoping he's going to say something. <laughs> you going to save him, Jerry? Well, through the chair, uh, Councillor Collins is absolutely right. We, we know where we inspect uh, sewers every year, uh, manholes, um, you know, with the new web coming, we, that, that information is there. It's all digital. It's not labor intensive at all. We can provide it, um, you know, just like we provide maps uh, to your specific wards. Here's mm -hmm. the work we've done over the year. I mean, that map could just be uploaded to the web. Um, 
and it, it shows the work's being done and, and we usually color code it by a year, you know, something like that. So that's, we have all that digitized so it's very easy to get onto the web for the, uh, the community to look at. And, and how then can we give direction to do that? I mean, I certainly put the motion today to come back with a plan that seeks to address that, but is there, are there budget issues surrounding that, Jerry, uh, before we would maybe give that direction? Because it, it is, especially after those storm events, the first question is when was the last time you did this X, Y, Z, and the resident starts to rhyme off, obviously, a number of maintenance activities. To have that on the, the web, um, you know, on a regular basis, I think, would go a long way to assure the public that we're not just responding after the fact. It's actually happening well before these storms roll through the city. I just use the storms as an example because it's a common one for me, but I'm certain that there are all kinds of other pieces of information that the public would be looking for to ensure that, in fact, we're addressing our infrastructure needs, inspections that take place, um, sewer outfalls in the valley, mm -hmm. the, the maintenance of those areas. That was on your list, Daryl, and that's a common one for me in, in Red Hill. People are walking through the valley on the trails and they see the, the grates are full of uh, garbage and debris and the first question is when was, when was the last time you were here? So that kind of stuff, um, is, is it basically a motion that would um, suffice today to, to ask you to come back, Jerry, with what could be posted on the, on the web on a regular basis? Uh, through the chair, uh, it, yeah, it can be a motion. I think we'll go to the, there's the web, uh, the IS working committee, mm -hmm. web development team, that's the name of it. We will um, take the motion and take it there. I mean, it's just, I don't, I don't know what the cost would be, but since we have it digitized and going electronic to electronic, I don't envision it being a, a significant cost. But a good example would be when we had the lower east end uh, drainage study, you know, that was uh, in Councilor Marula's ward when we went from uh, Ottawa all the way over to the Red Hill. We had the camera, everything, and, you know, the number and the work that came from that, um, you know, it, it is, it was a good news story because the, the, the number of floodings, while we still have a few, which, you know, is unfortunate, the numbers have, you know, probably decreased 95% and it, we should be out there telling our story better. So definitely put it onto the web development team. Okay. And I think we have a meeting actually tomorrow, so maybe because that's a corporate direction and not necessarily just public works, although public works is probably the key player in that, I'll uh, hold that motion and maybe present it uh, tomorrow. At, I am a member of that the uh, Web Redevelopment Committee, and I know Councillor Powers is shaking his head as our chairman. I, I'll save that motion for that time, but it's good to know and hear the information that, in fact, it's doable and, and it's probably something we can accomplish at low cost. So thanks for that, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Merle. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank uh, Vosav for this presentation. As Councillor Johnson alluded to, I, I don't recall one so thorough, and, and naturally I appreciate it, and I, I think I'm speaking on behalf of everyone around this table in saying that. On, on the same front, Councillor Collins and I earlier really spoke about the, I guess, the silo that everybody works in at the city, and I recall former Councillor Mitchell always talking about multitasking. I've got to give credit where credit's due, and he continually reminded us about the importance of that. But I find the frustration level uh, is increasing, even not only from a public works department, but I think citywide, corporate-wide. Uh, and I, I don't see a reason why, for instance, if a, an HSR bus driver sees something uh, that, that is out of place, whether it be something dumped on the side or litter or what have you, why they wouldn't be reporting it, because we're all working for the same corporation and we're all working for the same common good, and that is on behalf of the taxpayer. So I, I, I'd like to see something formally adopted where we can incorporate a, a better proactive uh, engagement of all of our employees, whether it be even the fact that we're a majority shareholder of Hydro or Hamilton Horizon, the fact that they, too, become part of a solution, as opposed to everybody just simply uh, driving around and walking around with blinders on. So at the appropriate time, what I'd like to do is maybe sit, sit down with Jerry and discuss a plan of, of trying to incorporate a corporate-wide proactive initiative that allows everyone to take responsibility for every single aspect of the city, especially those that are the simplest ones, such as graffiti and litter, and actually being proactive and, and actually reporting it. So well, I'll, don't I'll, we I'll, just uh, put that question? We do, I mean, yes. the buses where we have the most vehicles going down the yeah. roads regularly to Mr. Hall, he's here. Sure. Don, um, uh, any reaction to that? Absolutely. It's a good question, Mr. Chair. In fact, uh, I have a radio and I monitor our transmissions with the bus operators on an ongoing basis. And I can tell you there's several times a day, every day, that bus operators report 
things like roadkill or limbs down or issues with holes in the road. So, yeah, the, the operators play a very, very active role in uh, providing feedback to uh, operations and uh, maintenance, Mr. Chair. And, and that's wonderful, and I think we need to expand upon that uh, because I know just driving down Kenilworth Access as an example on a daily basis, uh, I see a number of our public works trucks, I see a number of buses going down, but I still see the same litter and the same stuff just literally sitting there. So if everybody can be more engaged, aware, and, and, and actually proactive and, uh, and go over and above their own call or duty, I think it would go a long way. But I think more importantly, we as a council should formalize the process and engage the entire corporation and even set up a rewards program accordingly uh, for those that do it more. Uh, so you'll more. work with the GM offline then to what, put a big well, what I'll do is I'll put it as a notice of motion that we will formulate something and then I'll speak to Jerry on the wording of it. Okay, so you have two notices of motion for today then? Yes. So the other one is more of a motion because it's tied into the. But having said that, um, on that front, I, I, I'd like to move that. Uh, secondly, uh, with respect to the uh, stormwater issue. Through you, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, as everyone realizes that in, in the East End, uh, we've had this issue. I recall the first episode of crisis that I was subjected to was back in 2004. We have come a long way, and I've, I've sta stated that quite clearly on a number of fronts and different forums, but it doesn't seem to get the same play as uh, slamming the city for flooding does, unfortunately. So it hasn't been as promoted, but I can assure you and concur with uh, Mr. Davis that um, Public works and, and, and staff and planning and frankly the entire corporation, and I know I can speak on behalf of the majority of Ward 4 residents, truly uh, commend the city for where we were and where we are today. And I can assure you that back in 2004, 2005, 2006, 2007, 8 and 9, we literally had thousands, and I'm not under, un, understating that amount, thousands of people impacted by that flooding. And it's unfortunate that got a lot of play, but the fact that they're not getting flooded these days isn't. So I do want to state here today and commend uh, Jerry Davis and all staff that have been involved in that process, including council. As I can recall, it was not uphill battle at first, but council definitely came around uh, and supported every initiative we brought forward to not only um, mitigate the issue, but eliminate it in many ways, but also be compassionate through the compassionate grants. And for that, this council, uh, I think, needs to be commended though, over the last decade. Uh, because we are where we are today because of this council. And I appreciate your time, Mr. Ball. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and uh, thanks very much, Daryl, for bringing this presentation. Just uh, uh, two or three questions, um, just to get some clarification. When does it become a point where operating, um, we're doing a section of road, it has to be done? It's not in the capital works, you know, it's not in the books. But will you consistently have to go week after week and start throwing asphalt down? When does it become a point between you and, and say, Gary, of saying, look, we, we're just wasting money here and this road has to be fixed? Or do we just continue to, to do it? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we actually this year uh, have put a new process in place with asset management to try to deal with those roads that we do go in year after year, or week after week, or even day after day to do repairs on. Um, we have, uh, we're going to be working with asset management to develop a, a list of, of um, roads that meet that category, and then we're going to look at doing what would be, I guess, called major rehabilitation of the road. It wouldn't be reconstruction. It would basically be a, a shave and pave that would take out care of the surface deficiencies and, uh, you know, allow that road to last another hopefully four or five years uh, to get it through. Um, now it, it is a, a work in progress uh, and it will depend on the uh, ability of uh, obviously our budget limitations as well as, um, you know, we want to make sure that we're not going in and, and shaving and paving a road where we're going to have water works going in, you know, the, the year after because they have to do, they have a sewer planned. So all those things are going to be taken, uh, taken into consideration and uh, we'll work with Gary's group, but it's going to be coordinated through Gary. Okay, that's, that's good to hear. Um, on the road cuts, um, if I remember, you know, we're, we're trying to package it all one together with one contractor. And we're, you know, we're playing catch up last year, and we, we've done a great job of of trying to um, get as many done as as we could, even during the the nice mild winter we had the year before. Um, 
but I, I, if I remember correctly, I thought the average rule cut now would be about six weeks away. It, is that still a, an area? Of Back, Gary? I think I, we heard the... Yeah, it's three years, Jerry. Yeah, it's, it's eight weeks from when who's ever initiated the road cut tells us they're done, whether it's Hydro or Bell, and they've, they've finished whatever they needed to do, or, or, or uh, Hamilton Waters put, you know, they've put in their, uh, they've repaired their uh, lateral or put in the new uh, water service and told us it goes into our, our uh, program immediately. It's, it's uh, eight weeks from the time we tell their contractor. Sometimes it'll take a week or so between that and getting it on the list, but once they get it on the list, it's guaranteed eight weeks, and we're at something like 97 or 98 percent on that on that eight on that eight weeks okay, because um, I, um, I even had a road cut last week where again we had to be we had to wait for a complaint large road cut um, our people fixed it up swept it all up you know from the contractor I think the contractor should have done that I guess where the people are complaining about is when we get large road cuts like that and we're using that coal patch or crappy asphalt, it gets into their cars, they get it onto their, their driveways, um, they're just constantly complaining it's going down the street. But again, I, get, I guess I got to ask is who is responsible for checking these road cuts up and what condition they're in? Because it doesn't seem the contractor is doing anything proactive, it, it just seems that it works on a, on a complaint basis. Again, through you, Mr. Chair, the the initiator is the guy that's responsible until we get there and do the final completion. It's in their best interest to do a good job the first time. If Daryl's crew has to go out and take care of something because we phoned them and they can't react in time, then they get charged whatever his time is plus uh, um, a premium on top of that in order to, to keep that topped up. Now, through the winter, there is not hot mix asphalt available unless it, they have a recycler or something like that. So over the winter months, it's unfortunate, but uh, the, the cold mix is, is sort of a um, the, the standard operating procedure until we get to where the crews are coming out and we can get the hot mix available. Okay, so, and, and I guess, I'm, I understand the six to eight weeks that you're, you're talking about, Gary. Um, because when I had this road cut done last week, I asked a specific question. When will the final restoration get done? And uh, so we're talking middle of April now, okay? Um, and my answer I got back, late July, August. Terry? I, th I think, you know, if, if, if that, whoever gave you that answer, I mean, you know, we should talk to them. That's not our policy. Okay. It's clear. If it's a city person who told you that, you know, once it, it comes to us, it's clear. It's eight weeks. We've committed to council doing that. So when we hear things like that, give us the name. Let us follow up on it. Um, and maybe I, we just, you know, it's a bit of training we have to do. But that's not an acceptable answer. Okay. I, I appreciate that. And I'll send that to, to Gary and, and uh, to you. I appreciate that. And my last question is, um, with all the road works and, and, and everything that... Uh, or I'm hearing that uh, presentation you're making. What about sidewalks? Do we do anything on sidewalk um, repairs or anything proactive? Or we got somebody out there inspecting them? <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Through you, Mr. Chairman, yes. We do a complete inspection of every sidewalk within the city once a year. And any, our road patrollers are also checking for major sidewalk deficiencies as they are patrolling. So when I talk about um, roadways, I should have made it clear it's right-of-way. So anything that's within the right-of-way, the road patrollers are checking. Okay, so then uh, I will I'll contact you, Darrell, on, on offline on some stuff that I know it's, a, it's over a year or two, two years old. And just continue to crumble, but may have been missed, may have not, may be on the books, but I'll, I'll talk to you on, offline okay. on that. Thanks very much. Thank you, Council White. You take the chair. I'm going to ask a question now. Uh, uh, first of all, Darrell, um, you got the snow plows off the truck shed? Through you, Mr. Chairman, I don't know. I, I was off sick last week. I haven't even been into the yard, so. I sure hope you do, because we don't want any more storms this year. And, uh, but that, that leads me into my second question. Uh, as soon as the, the ground dries up, which will be very, very soon, we'll be getting lots of complaints about street sweeping, picking the sand up that you placed on, uh, on the roads during the 
tough winter we had. Have you started the street sweeping program yet? You, Mr. Chairman, yes, we have. How many sweepers are out in the city right now? <clears throat> I, I don't have the exact number, but I, I can provide you that information. Could you, you know, if you could just break it down a bit, but maybe by ward or certainly by district, uh, it'd be helpful to know how many street sweepers out there. And do you reverse the order you did them in last year? Do you, first ones you did last year, will they be the last ones this year? What's your program for street sweeping? Uh, through you, Mr. Ch Chairman, I'll have to, I can include all that in the email. I don't know off the top of my head. And give us a benchmark, how many street sweepers you put out last year and how many are going out this year? On the sidewalk, I've noticed, um, uh, I wonder what technology you're using now. When you get a slab shift through the winter and uh, create the trip hazard, is, is, the, is the fix now to go in and grind the edge down or do you actually pump in the grout and lift the settled slab back up? What's, what's the, the solution you use the most? Through you, Mr. Chairman, our preferred solution is to use the mud and raise the slab. Uh, when you grind a slab, you replace one deficiency with another because now your, your slab is thinner than it should be and going down the road, eventually that'll cause you issues. However, some of the, again, through MMS compliance, some, uh, we do that slab, the, the mud contract once a year. Uh, we've picked locations, so locations that can wait uh, and, and be done as part of that contract we do. There is some instances where we can't wait, that the deficiency or the trip hazard is too great and we will actually go out and grind it um, and that will cover the deficiency uh, for the trip hazard. I, I agree with you. I've noticed where you do the grinding. I don't know whether the clip is too light and it bounces a lot, but generally you just put a little taper on the, on the lip, the, the trip hazard, and then you have to go back and put a piece of asphalt in and the, it doesn't look very becoming. So you don't have our, we don't have our own equipment in each district to drill that one inch hole in the grout pump to pump the grout in and lift those slabs up so we can do them on a regular basis. We only do it once a year. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, no, we, we don't have the equipment in house that to, to do that work. Okay, and so they come in just do them all in, in two or three week period and then they're done for the year? It's about a, th through you, Mr. Chairman, it's about a three month period that the contract lasts and uh, the last two years we've put out significantly larger contracts uh, to address, I believe last year we addressed over 1,700 slabs. And as the technology has emerged on, on pressure grouting, has the price dropped per slab? The price is coming down per slab, yes. Any idea roughly what it costs to fix a settled slab? Through you, Mr. Chairman, no, not off the top of my head. Okay, and, and I also want to publicly compliment you on well, first of all, criticize the lousy job you did at Boxing Day, but criticize or compliment you on the subsequent two big storms we had. Whatever you did differently, I think it's referred to as bare pavement. Uh, that's the standard now, uh, Daryl? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, yes. When we activate into the residentials, uh, class three roads, the uh, target goal is bare pavement. Perfect. Okay, thanks very much, and a great job in the last two storms. I, I know there were some hot spots like Dundas, but uh, I think citywide and generally that we saw some, some significant improvements in that change in policy. Um, will there be another tender this year for the private contractors or is that locked down? We're gonna have experienced guys back in next winter. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, this contract is, uh, the contract for the standby and the on-call I believe is for three and five years respectively. So, or sorry, three and four years respectively. So we will uh, start looking at that um, it, it, two, at least two more years on each Okay, contract. so don't, you don't have certain parts of the city that expire every year. You do it citywide when you do that procurement. Through you, Mr. Chairman, that's correct. We do it citywide. Okay, that's all my questions. Take Thank back. you. I had myself and then Councillor Marula. Take your, uh, um, Councillor White. So, you had another citywide. Powers is on first as the first time speaker. So first off, I can attest that the street sweeper is working well as it passed by my window at 4 a 9 a.m. Um, so uh, just to let you know, the job's doing just a great job and things such as that, and I didn't even have to need set my alarm clock after that. Um, question about the road cut repair program. This is probably through you, Mr. Chair, to Mr. Moore, and that we made a decision to invest resources and uh, aggressively get on top of the list. So where are we in having dealt with that outstanding list? It was quite a substantial one, and uh, and uh, I have some direction or perhaps a supplementary report when we're going to be on, I'm going to call it, on top of the outstanding list, <coughs> notwithstanding the additions to it. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, we, we went through the last winter and uh, paid the premium 
it helped with the warm weather to get caught up on everything we had outstanding. Because typically we don't repair the cuts through the winter. It ends when the asphalt ends at the end of December, comes back in near the 1st of May. So right now the only backlog that we would have would be whatever occurred over this winter that will take us to start this May. I can, uh, I, I can get the actual numbers and uh, send that out through an email to the committee through Andy. I, I don't need that. The fact that we're on top of what was uh, long outstanding is, is great. Now that we're, I'm going to say, semi-current, let's do our best to stay on top of it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Whitehead. Yeah, I was just going to ask, um, it's clear through some of the discussions here that uh, uh, road cuts are becoming uh, very... Um, topical subject. Uh, I would ask uh, if we got, any, I've heard we got an eight week policy in regards to the full construct with the exception of the winter months when the plant isn't opened. Uh, it would be helpful if, uh, if there's a way or if you can provide each ward uh, the cuts that are, cert, uh, uh, are scheduled to uh, uh, be re complete reconstruct and, um, and the time frame and obviously the time frame so that uh, when we get the calls uh, we have ready information in front of us because that we get a lot of calls on road cuts and it would be helpful to have that information in front of us. So is there a way that that can happen, Mr. Chair? Daryl, you want to take that or, yep. or Gary? Would... Yep, through you, Mr. Chair. We're, we're working on that. We're working on, on a web-based um, information um, protocol that would give you uh, the ability for anyone to, to see who made the cut, when they made the cut, what the status of the cut is, whether it's been put on the list, when it's scheduled to be repaired, um, as well as uh, any of the other capital works. We have to coordinate with the, um, with the, um, the web um, going forward and, and IS and uh, as, as well as the city manager's open data. It's all part of that, it would be an integral thing. We're, we're working on it behind the scenes to try and get that advanced. Um, but uh, so, so, Mr. What I'm asking, though, in the meantime, understand that that's great. I think Councilor Miller mentioned it as well. Uh, but I, what I'm looking for in the interim, when my assistants are getting the calls, they don't have ready information in front of them. It would be helpful. So I'm not talking about you know eventually you're going to get to the website, and that's great, and we won't probably have to deal with it as much. But right now we do, and unfortunately our our AAs do not have the uh, the uh, the information in front of them, and they have to make inquiry after inquiry after inquiry. If in fact that information is readily available in front of them when those inquiries come in, it's very helpful. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm already going to send out uh, an information update on the um, the road cuts and give you that single point of contact, that phone number, that email that they can call and get that update because we can we can search it almost instantaneously and tell you what the status of any cut is. Appreciate. It. Thank you. Final one is Councillor Maroda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just on the street uh, sweeper issue, I know that uh, throughout the last couple of years, I've had uh, some communication with staff surrounding the possibility of increasing the frequency within the industrial core for obvious reasons. So through you, Mr. Um, uh, Chairman, has any thought been given about a two-tier system where that there's obviously neighborhoods are not created equal. If you're living, if you're living adjacent to DeFasco or Stelco or any other industrial um, a factory, you're going to be subjected to far more dust and other elements that are going to require a street sweeper. But yet, the, the frequency is equal in those neighborhoods as they are in Ancaster, as an example. So uh, I think everyone would agree that that would be inequitable, considering what those neighborhoods adjacent to DeFasco are being subjected to. Uh, I was assured that uh, they would increase the frequency, but I, I was a little bit skeptical uh, because we don't have a formal policy of council to do so. And so through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, could we have some sort of indication, firstly, of whether or not the, increase in, the frequency has increased in the industrial core? And secondly, if not, I will be bringing forward another notice of motion accordingly. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, Thank you. So through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, can you help me out here? Through you, Mr. Chairman, we have increased the frequency within the industrial core, but I'm not sure 
where we have increased the, efficient, the frequency is addressing the issue that you're talking about. You're talking about the residential neighborhoods close that are, yeah, so we have increased in the industrial core on the, um, you know, in, in the core area itself, like uh, Burlington Street and, and things like that. So uh, we can take a look at that if that's the committee's wish to, to take a look at those residential neighborhoods that are close Get to that. Get information report back to committee. Just staff direction would be okay? Um, no, I prefer to, I prefer a motion. Right. So, yeah, I can move that accordingly. That would be, that would be great. That's okay. 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 Council waited. Yeah, you're just being the final speaker. Why don't you okay. move it then? Okay, thanks. Just an information report to come back yeah. to council. According on to increasing the frequency of street sweeping in industrial areas. That's in residential industrial areas. That's correct. Okay, seconded to that. Second by way to discussion. All in favor? Carry. Okay, I think we're finished now. Need motion received, oh, Councilor Powers. Yes. Seconded by Councilor Jackson. All in favor? Carry. Thank you, Daryl. Okay, I see there are no discussion items, so we'll move on to motions. Councilor Whitehead. Uh, bumped into Councilor Farr. Uh, apparently on the stop list, and he stopped his staff, there was one that was missed. So he sent me the email and asked if I would move it. Now, weigh the rules and have it moved. No. One was missed, though. So I need to, I would need it waived. Go back to you when we get to notices of motions then. Okay. Otherwise, I believe you, Councilor Collins, you have the same one? I have a notice. It's probably just. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll move now motions and, and item 9.1, Council Whitehead, if you take the chair, I'd like to uh, place this motion and, and get a seconder to it. Second by Councillor Powers, and um, this is just a, a piece of property that we've come across in Ancaster. We're not sure who owns it, and it's a way of our trail. If you have any questions, Cynthia Graham's here, and, and she'll tell you why she needs this motion to proceed with the trail. So, through you to uh, Cynthia yourself, uh, Mr. Chair, just to help me, is it the sliver that runs right down the middle of the of the map? It was hard to read the. Uh, the legend, so it's uh, it's that piece that runs, I'm going to call it north-south, right down the middle of the property. Okay. Through you, Mr. Chair, yes, uh, the, the small sliver uh, of piece of land that runs um, up and down the, the page. Okay, yep. thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Merlo. So moved by uh, Councillor Ferguson, second by Councillor Powers. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favour? Yeah. Any opposed? Carried. Mr. Whitehead, and uh, move on to notice of motion. Uh, Councilor Maruda? Well, you can move to raise the rules if you like. Okay, so I'll, I'll move to waive the rules to introduce a motion surrounding the school board synergies with uh, infrastructure development. Second by Councilor Johnson. All in favor? Carry. Place your motion then. Uh, on the motion, it's moved by myself, seconded by uh, Councilor Duvall. The staff be directed to assess the contributing factors of the uh, lack of synergy in the construction of new schools and conjunction with city infrastructure, and B, that a plan of action be developed to prevent future schools opening without city infrastructure adequately developed. So it's a report back on both A and B then. Councilor, or Mr. Davis, any issues or questions with that? No? Councilor Whitehead. Yeah, no problem. I, we did, I didn't hear that. You didn't turn your mic on. CC. To, to, to copy this motion to, to the school board. zone committee. Perfect. Okay. Discussion on the motion. All in favor? Carried. Carried. Councilor Collins, do you have a, a motion? Uh, Notice that I would uh, move to waive the rules. Okay, she's moving to waive the rules. Second by Whitehead. All in favor? Carried. Carried. Mr. Motion. And it's uh, whereas the seniors of 155 Martinique have concluded that crossing at Park and Bold has become cumbersome and unsafe over time, therefore be it resolved that a two-way stop intersection be implemented at Park and Bold in the Durand. That's on behalf of Councilor Farr. Seconded by? Councillor Marilla, staff, any issues? Any questions or comments? Oh, can, or if we could just add that the appropriate amending uh, bylaw be, be passed uh, because the uh, bylaw is next. The mover's quite prepared to do that, so is the seconder. Yep. Okay, all in favor? Carried. Any other notices? Yes, yes. Councillor Marilla. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to move by myself that, um, that uh, staff be directed that in conjunction with the council or committee to develop a, uh, an incentive program to better incorporate a corporate-wide incentive program for um, proactive 
reporting of graffiti and other public works issues uh, throughout the city. Did you write that down? I will. <laughs> no, I didn't, but I will. <laughs> be I think the clerk will, will, will be, but the, for the, the theme will be similar. Uh, Mr. Clerk, do we need a motion to weigh the rules on that, or is it because it was discussed today, it's okay just to place it? Um, if the committee um, decides that it was part of the presentation, then it, it can just be a motion. I'll, I'll share, I think it was. So So the motion is before us. Uh, now, Mr. Clerk, do you understand what the motion is? Uh, yes, I believe so, yep. Uh, and for a report back yeah. to this committee. That's correct. Okay, all in favor? Okay. Any Councillor Whitehead? Yeah, I, I need the waive the rules for uh, uh, a motion by Councillor uh, Farr, again. Uh, Not the same intersection, is no, it? No, no. <laughs> whereas, whereas the ward councillor has consulted the parents and school staff at the Beasley neighbourhood along with the appropriate staff who, has, who have no issue with this measure, therefore be it resolved that an all-way stop be erected at the intersection of Ferguson Avenue North and Kelly Street in front of Dr. Davies School. Okay, I see staff jittering a bit at this one, and, and so that's the notice right now. We have to vote on a waiver wait, rules. Wait, wait, well, my understanding is it was supposed to be it was supposed to be on this list and was missed. The list we proved which today. which list? The list we proved today. Intersection, Intersection control, control list. Can uh, Martin, you want to help us out? Thank you, Mr. Chair. It was uh, we missed the agenda review for this meeting. It was going to be on for next meeting. But there's some haste in the neighborhood, and we don't object. Okay, the motion's been put before us. And first, I, th I think this we, we probably need a motion to weigh the rules on this one because oh, that was item 5.4, right. the, the consent item. Andy, help you out here. Um, you could you could amend. Um, we we already appro approved that report, so uh, yeah, waiving the rules would be. Okay, so you're moving away the rules, seconded by Councillor Maroon. All in favor, carried. So here the motion, uh, seconded to that. Councillor Collins, all in favor? Carried. carried. Thank you. Seconder? Uh, Whitehead, all in favor? Carried. Are there any items of general information? Gary, any items you want to talk about? I'm good, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We just you. want Councillor Smart to stay on vacation a little longer so we don't get all these walk ons. Is that what I heard? <laughs> All, a motion to adjourn. Moved by power, seconded by Duval. All in favor, carried.